My name is Bob Grunier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So welcome to this evening's presentation. If someone can let me know if I can hear you, that would be great. It's good to have so many people in the room already. And we've got something for you today, which uh, I've uh, I, personally, I've been wanting to find an answer to for very, very many years. And um, the slide that I have here, uh, that is the cover slide for the presentation, Making Galaxies, this 20th of March, 2022. Great, thanks for the sound check. Uh, was a, the image in the background there is the Galaxy Triplet ARP274, and I've rotated it 180 degrees, and you will understand why later in the presentation. But actually, when I was doing my research for O'Day, this uh, image really struck me as something that possibly could be explained by what uh, I was observing on the Lion Reactor. And we're just going to refresh over a couple of slides that led me to believe that. But I actually saved this into the O'Day directory on the 28th of January 2018 at 22 minutes in the morning. And it comes from the Hubble Space Telescope. And when I saved it, it, it never actually made it into the O'Day deck, the 117 or so slides, or 107, well, well over 100 slides um, in the O'Day deck. Um, and that's because I didn't ever have an adequate explanation for it at the time that I was uh, putting those sort of, uh, what should we call it, a, a four-year lesson plan, five-year lesson plan uh, out. Um, because, yeah, so, uh, but I think probably... Uh, we have enough uh, evidence to have a good stab at understanding what is going on uh, in this image and how these things come into being, at least on a phenomenological basis. Okay, so, excellent, Rod. All right, galaxies. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah, before I do that, I'm going to go to something else which uh, we... I, I made a short presentation of. I'm going to do another one uh, in the next couple of days coming uh, with regard to ultrasound. Uh, but this is all about vibration in general, and you know that now. Um, so let me just uh, get up this one, if it's going to let me do it. Is it going to let me do it? No, it's not going to let me do it. Why is it not let me do that? Uh, okay. All right. So... And I'll switch mice. There we go. Okay, so uh, this is on remote view, and this is today's presentation. I hope uh, some of you have had a chance, if you haven't already read them before, to have read through. And we're going to look at these. The 1956 Bostic paper, Experimental Study of Ionized Matter Projected Across a Magnetic Field. And the Bostic uh, 1957 paper, Experimental Study of Plasmoids. So these are the two that we're going to start out by looking at here. But if I go back, I just want to just talk a little bit about this review of cavitation X-ray emission experiments. And essentially, uh, Vladimir Vysotsky, uh, who lives in Ukraine, in Kiev, he was trying to explain with his Russian colleague, Ala Kornilova, uh, the uh, X-rays by Karabut. And... Uh, they did experiments starting at around 2004. They first published in 2007. But the first time that the community was really made aware of this was at ICCF 18 in Minnesota uh, uh, at uh, Missouri University. And I happened to be uh, party to looking at Vladimir's poster session. Um, and he was. Uh, it, it was so interesting that they asked him to do a late night uh, uh, presentation of the rough sort of concepts of that which he did but essentially uh, it is when a cavitation bubble collapses uh, it produces soft x-rays around the order of 1 keV and that this gets instantly absorbed by the surrounding water and that causes a shock wave the actual absorption of the vast output of very soft x-rays and the shock wave then travels to a metal that goes towards the other side of the metal surface and then you get reflection at the surface of the metal and that causes a transverse coherence of the metal uh, ions the metal matter the metal uh, um, element nuclei 
and they cohere and there is an excited uh, state of that coherence and then that collapses and it emits x-rays as well as zaser which is sound amplification by stimulated emission of radiation so if you remember when i was uh, talking about uh, that when you look at the description here the laser is a sonic equivalent of the laser and often referred to as sound laser or acoustic lasers laser beam can uh, uh, concentrate sorry laser beam concentrated sound waves in the terahertz range uh, that while uh, still mostly a curiosity in the scientific world lasers offer a number of potential practical uses and one of them is down here at low frequencies a laser can produce sound at a distance and I said well isn't that a bit like an LRAD and if you had an LRAD producing sound at a distance then if that hits something hard and you get reflection you will end up with soft uh, sorry x-rays actually in this case and you will end up with um, uh, coherent matter and so uh, that's where the damage can occur and uh, there's some excellent tests that he conducted one was with this extremely high pressure metal cutting water jet and if he had an x-ray wrapped around here the jet so half of it was showing the water exposed to the water x-rays because there are x-rays emitted from the water and half of it was exposed to the metal this uh, what he found was that the ones that were exposed to the metal emissions of x-rays uh, fogged the film very successfully and not so much below and then he later found out that um, depending on the element used uh, so, for instance, water produces this very, very low, uh, very, very soft X-ray from the surface, from the phase conjugation, from that reflection, from that coherence on the surface. But if you use iron, you get uh, somewhere up to about 1.75 kV. But if you use lead, you can get all the way up to, you know, well, the iron will produce up to sort of 3.6 kV. And the lead will produce up to 7.5 maybe KV. So the heavier the element you use, then the heavier, uh, the higher the X-rays that can be observed. And in response here to Stephen B. Halls, um, he's asking some question and saying that maybe one of the ways to uh, protect ourselves from this radiation and maybe uh, the coherent matter radiation is to have uh, light metals in there or as I say many layers of different metals uh, and insulators metal insulator like my strange radiation shield um, I said that this might explain the uh, observation of Russ George and in Russ George's case uh, if you go to here uh, maybe it'll pull it up yes so this is on atomicology by Russ George and they he was doing a, a deuterated palladium experiment and using some sort of uh, undisclosed excitation but he stayed with me for about three days in my house uh, a, f a number of years ago and basically he was using ultrasonics most of the time so i expect that was ultrasonics his excitation and uh, he had a geiger counter and when um he was running the experiments there was basically nothing coming out however he says here um when the experiment was underway, suddenly the Geiger started collecting a few extra counts. Thinking that the signal might be very weak x-rays, I reached for something in the lab bench to place between the source and the Geiger. The thinking being that this would block the x-rays, right? Not do what actually happened. What came to hand was a lid from a tin can. Obviously, tin can is obviously normally just steel and uh, can be tin coated. Uh, when I placed it in front of the Geiger counter so as to shield it, in fact, the count, rent, count, count rate went up significantly. And if you ever meet Russ George, this is the story he tells you. This is the machine guns of Edward Teller. Okay, I said to myself, this is strange. And I tried it again and again with always the same result. Now, what could be coming out of the experiment and hitting a bit of iron and making more radiation? Okay, neutrons were always demanded by cold fusion skeptics and, and, and perhaps this experiment, which was not so cold fusion experiment, might be the lucky one. 
Uh, so he thought it might be uh, uh, neutrons. So anyway, he says, I wonder what else might catch a neutron and yield even more radiation. Ah, yes, silver might do nicely. So I scrounged in my lab until I found a piece of silver metal about the size of the thickness of a business card, placing the silver foil in between the experiment and the Geiger counter was very revealing. The instant the silver was in the count uh, on the Geiger counter went so, sorry, the instant the silver was in, the count on the Geiger counter went so high as to totally saturate the counter. Many thousands of counts. It only took me a couple of tries uh, at this to realize that I was not at all safe doing the experiment at arm's length and I shut it down. So essentially, he thought that th this was neutrons. I don't believe it is. I don't believe it is. I believe that probably this was a coherent sound wave. And uh, if we go back to the presentation here, um, I go back here maybe. Uh, nope, I go back here and I go back here. I believe it is the same thing that was occurring with uh, here and that the his reactor was emitting coherent sound uh, and that was interacting with the metal and he he used uh, iron and then he used silver obviously silver is heavier than iron so that will produce more intense x-rays which are more likely to get through the window of the x-ray device and produce uh, uh, a signal now if you can imagine that at your surface you're creating coherent transverse ions, uh, co co coherent transverse atoms rather, that are in an excited state, if you were to resonantly pump that and pump that and pump them rather than just a shock wave, well then if they're getting more and more coherent, then could they become coherent matter and then start to collapse? And that is my question. So. In this work, Vladimir Vysotsky is saying that actually th this isn't caused by Lena uh, that causes these x-rays to come out. But I'm arguing that the continuing pumping of the process, such that you do with, for instance, in the Hutchison effect, will lead to Lena, lead to these yin-yang structures all over the surface at resonant nodes, as I've shown you on many samples and including... Hutchison samples. So that was an aside. If you missed that, I didn't really do a presentation of that. Um, uh, I just thought I wanted to go through that before we dig into today's presentation. So uh, has anyone got any questions on that? Okay, if not, then we will uh, crack on. Okay. <laughs> Just kill that for a second. Right. Got a nice big mouse for you today. Okay. All right. So this is a making galaxies. And uh, the first thing that I saw on the Lion reactor... This is the first line that I got, and I was taking these images in September of 2017. And this area here, I saw these structures, and I noticed these sort of what almost look like reflected uh, things on there. And I had predicted this by predicting there was fl flux loops, and I went to see if there was anything on there that was like it. And uh, you can maybe see here when I click it, there are reflected things that seem to have their own life and so forth. So um, this was one sort of flux loop, like a magnetic flux loop that I thought I saw. And I thought that maybe one of these uh, sections could be something similar to or related to this butterfly structure. Then we actually observed these kind of north pole, south pole structures. Uh, over the reactor outside, again in a similar sort of area, uh, jumping between uh, oxidized co uh, coils. 
Anyway, I'd sent a, a bunch of these images off uh, to Alan Goldwater and he came back and he found uh, something that looked interesting uh, because it looked a little bit like a zigzag, which looked like some of the strange radiation tracks that I observed coming from the echo fuel earlier in the year. And we looked at this again. You can see this was on the uh, 18th of September 2017. And so we saw the structures and this one down here uh, rotated is the symbol for remote view. So in case you wondered what that little thing was in that uh, uh, icon there, that's what that is. It's this one down here. It's the first footprint of the lion's uh, paw tracks on here. And looking around on this sample a bit more, around these uh, magnetic sort of uh, flux uh, pairs, the cannon as I called them, there was what I called the galaxies on the surface of the line. And I shared this first, actually, as some of the slides that I shared from the Oday deck in October in Sochi in Russia of 2018, later the same year in which I drafted Oday. And uh, on this one here, we have a three-arm spiral galaxy. And it has a dome on it, so it's coming sort of out or in one, one or the other. And then over here, we have a two-arm spiral galaxy. So these are pointing to something that's about here and here. And so there's a, there's a kind of some sort of spiral structure uh, that's in here, but it has these substructures on it that are pulling material in. And this has three of them on there. And so uh, over here, we have uh, these flux loops uh, on this modified Hutchison sample. I just grabbed this particular thing. But anyway, uh, the interesting part for me was on this particular part of the reactor here. This is So the actual strange radiation track is on this crack line here uh, where my mouse is. And just beyond that, there's all this material that was giving uh, weird uh, spectrum uh, outputs uh, depending, on, depending on incident angle. And something was going on which was wrong. And this, this didn't happen with the starting material. But anyway, when you looked at it, there was a four-point cross up here, which more looks like a swastika. And down here uh, in the element ma map, there was a five-point uh, cross. So uh, maybe it will play it. So here you can see there's this, uh, it's not so clear, but it's a, it's a five-point one. And the one up there was a, a four-point one. It's, it doesn't show up in all of the different maps. Uh, and it also has these yin yangs around it. So this was the first time that I thought that maybe the the things around the outside were uh, pairs of structures. Okay. Or, or, or at least their own plasmoids, as we will see later. So in the next slide, I, I kind of zoom into that. And so I've, I've gone into this section here to look at that, and that's, uh, that's blown up. So, in theory, this will show this. Okay, so here is the kind of fairly weak five point. You can see our paisleys here. So these are the same sort of plasmoid structures that you would see on the um, uh, the Bogdanovich work and, and what we saw on various scales on Hutchison samples in triangles and spirals. But it's kind of this slide where I'm uh, overlaying some of these weird uh, element maps that came back. And we have these these sort of plasmoid marks, but they're not physically there. These are physical holes. But these are uh, different energy x-rays that are coming back, but you can't see it on the actual material. So it was a bit weird. So we have like a, a gap here with this element map, and we have this... Uh, sort of tadpole here we have a tadpole and a gap we have a tadpole and a gap and uh, so you know this this was what I saw that made me think that uh, whatever this was was a fundamental force of nature and that it could produce galaxy like self-organized structures and it had to be related to 
strange radiation, whatever that was. And it had to be related to magnetic flux type effects as, as uh, was seen here with this north and south. So those, it all pointed to magnetism so, and so forth. And so on uh, the first days in January, I, I had this in a dream and uh, it, I hadn't read a lot of work in the field, but it came to me as some sort of torus with a poloidal and uh, toroidal and uh, poloidal uh, sort of flux and uh, this thing pulling in and that's that. So um, it was much, much later that uh, in 2020 that I came across the Solin pattern and that explained things that I saw uh, later on the Lion reactor. Anyway, this was a uh, Lion 1's uh, uh, quartz and we've talked about this before and it, it always confused me how these things seem to it had to be stable for a long period of time and they seem to be connected and always one on top of the other and you know we've discussed this to at great length and again th this one is even bigger and it's it for some reason there's something coming out of the center here and landing down on here and it was synthesizing elements on here that weren't in this silicon dioxide and weren't in this cantal wire so there was some flux loop there Okay, so um, if we go to our next slide here, uh, I've related this to the kind of ear that you get here and so forth and said that they, they could uh, be connected. But if we overlay our um, counter-rotating vortices of this triplet galaxy here, um, this, this is the cardioid type structure, okay? And here's uh, one side going around that way and one side going around that well, that way. And as we're going to learn, these are called barred galaxies. And this is very important because the structure of this is something that we've seen in our ultrasonic work and was also seen by Bostic. So probably at this point, I'm going to jump into the work of Bostic. Um, but before that, I just want to show this one here, which is from the other work which I've been talking about recently which is also ultrasonics and we have our vortices here and effectively these barred galaxy structures and the thing that I want to draw more attention to here in this particular one and we will come and let me remind me if I don't remind, remember myself I need to show you some images at the end uh, just on the web uh, of different galaxies but from this barred spiral and from this barred spiral and these do appear to be rotating the same way but these are rotating in counter uh, um, rotation directions out of the core of this it's there's a spiral structure coming out and it, it's going um round there round there round there and out of the core of this it appears that there's another spiral structure coming out uh, and it's going around the other direction is this feeding this maybe is this feeding this maybe i don't know but they do seem to be connected and maybe there's a relationship between these two in a way but what i do know is the first thing that i saw on the vibrator plate of roisha namaza is this structure here and that from the center there is a spiral coming out of it and maybe it's going over to some structure up at the top side here and when we looked at some of these uh, structures under the microscope, we saw that there were pairs. And we called this the uh, the cardioid again, but also the figure of eight. Now, bearing in mind, when I took this uh, image and, and put it into my uh, directory for O'Day, I had not seen any of this, none, none of this. I, I'd seen this and this and this and this. <laughs> so that was enough for me. And this and this, that was enough. That was enough. Uh, but I had not seen uh, uh, this work of Solin and I had not seen uh, these uh, items. I had not seen this work. Uh, obviously, I had not seen this. I had not seen this and so on and so on and so on. And so I had not seen this. And I, I mentioned this a, a number of weeks back where these plasmoid structures seem to have two units in them, two units in them, two bright spots, two bright spots. And down, down the bottom as well, you can't see it there. But... Um, with this particular sound-induced structure, you've got these standing 
nodes here and you have this vortical thing coming in and you have two spots and the two spots it, this comes all the way around here it goes into the back side of this one and in this one it comes in here and it's going into the front side so this is like this is the bar in the bar galaxy and uh, for whatever reason these maintain some kind of distance uh, from each other and the material is condensing into the back side of this and into the kind of front side of this I do want someone or myself <laughs> at some point to replicate this with much higher uh, speed and much higher fidelity cameras to confirm this because it's actually a relatively simple experiment but anyway the point is is you get two spots two spots two spots two spots and that this is acting like a spiral galaxy and i wonder if these aren't doing something similar the other thing is is like this is pointing at that angle sort of kind of like i don't know 45 or, or 30 degrees from the surface this is pointing at the opposite angle and it's kind of like are these two in some sort of relationship in the same way that these two are in some sort of relationship yeah okay so would this be considered one ball and this is another ball but then these are two are kind of they've oriented themselves in some sort of relationship in a similar way to the way this one here and this one here here has this this pattern is is repeating and here again in the sound uh, of the ultra experiment you've got the bar this is a circle in the middle a circle in the middle and then you have a spiral arm coming off there and a spiral arm coming off there if you zoom into this this is where the transmutation is occurring here. This is where the transmutation is occurring here. You've got a spiral arm going the other way and you can imagine that there was one coming there but it's not so clear. But anyway, they are counter rotating and the same thing is going on in this. There's a spin coming through there and there's a spin going around in that point. And we're not the only people to observe this. I've talked about Min Juin Huang, Professor of New Energy Center, Department of Mechanical Engineering, National Taiwan University. and he observed this and it's very 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 clear on this you have the rounder section in the middle and you have the uh sort of this is the bar this is the bar and this is the thing that leads out to the spiral okay so now i'm going to jump into the papers and we're going to walk through those because there's several important things and i've only just read these uh again and in fact i only ever skim read them many years ago but this is the first time i've actually gone through them today and i actually i, I thought before i make a comment on a bar uh, spiral galaxy i should probably find out something about it and so just just gone uh, about 0030 this morning i decided to do a quick search and the first article i came up with it literally literally blew my mind um, and I think it basically it, it, it is the same phenomenon they're describing that we are witnessing in uh, ultrasonic based coherent systems and in plasma based coherent systems. And, I'll, uh, you know, <laughs> it just points to the fact that this is working on every level as above, so below. So I'm going to cut from the main presentation here into looking at Bostick's work and uh, and I, ha I won't read you the whole thing but I've highlighted some points and, and so you can see also how he went about making his uh, his uh, structures okay so this is experimental study of ionized matter projected across a magnetic field from October the 15th 1956 yes so a plasma gun has been developed, which sounds very cool, doesn't it? A plasma gun, uh, which projects ionized matter, metallic and deuterium ions at speeds of up to two times 10 to the seven centimeters per second. That's a lot of distance in a short amount of time. Plasmoids possess a measurable magnetic moment, a measurable translation speed, a transverse electric field and a measurable size plasmoids can interact with each other seemingly by reflecting off one another their orbits can also be made to curve toward one another plasmoids can be made to spiral 
to a stop if projected into a gas at about 10 to the minus 3 millimeters of mercury pressure. Plasmoids can also be made to smash each other into fragments. There is some scant evidence to support the hypothesis that they undergo fission and possess spin. Well, I think in this term, when they're in this particular description, when he means fission, he means that this whatever this electro, uh, electron ion structure, um, it, 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 as it's a unit, if they bash into each other, they become smaller subunits uh, rather than actual fission. Okay, so production of a plasmoid in free space. Evidence in the form of a probe traces suggests that the plasma is emitted in a toroidal form, as postulated in detail in figure 2. We'll just talk about that in a sec. This photograph, which displays uh, the plasma in its own recombination light, further confirms our, this is fig 3, our suspicion that the plasma is emitted not as an amorphous blob, but in the form of a torus, as postulated in figure 2. So basically, they have this gun here. And I'm going to zoom into it so it's clearer for you. Uh, so this is a resin container. They have copper lead-in wires. And this is titanium, which is loaded with deuterium. So I guess maybe it's been electrolytically loaded with deuterium. And it has a ceramic disc. I guess that's to uh, protect the bulk of the titanium that's deuterated from the uh, high temperature of the emission of what uh, might be called an ecton or an evo and then uh, it's 0.04 of an inch wire electrodes made of titanium and there's a 0.005 inch of a gap so this is really I think probably quite easy to replicate in uh, modern terms and then what happens is they do a pulse discharge and you have a current between I guess the the cathode and anode or whatever and uh, so that's flowing in that direction and as it comes out you, what you do is you, the, the, there's a very low pressure environment in here although he does vary the pressure so there's basically no ele uh, no ions in here to be uh, electrolyzed uh, or, or ionized rather and what happens is some of the metal ions vaporize alongside the deuterium ions so you then have the plasmoid formed and it has a current and uh, the magnetic whatever uh, and it comes out and you can see that it's fatter on this side and, and thinner on this side because of the the uh, uh, the flux uh, rejoining on the back side and so this is kind of like a you know a, maybe like a coronal mass ejection type thing and uh, Mechanism of projection of plasmoid, no uh, externally excited magnetic field is employed. Velocity of projection is this way, and this is 10 centimeters, I guess that's uh, what he's got there. Okay, so here you get a description, maybe no one's ever um, thought about this as to why, why it's called plasmoid. Plasmoid, a word which means plasma magnetic entity. Plasma magnetic entity. This research was performed under the auspice, uh, this, the, the suspices, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe auspices, I don't know, uh, of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. The term plasmon, in line with the term gion, used by Wheeler, was originally proposed. However, David Pines of Princeton University has pointed out that the term plasmon should be reserved for a quantum of plasma oscillation energy. He kindly proposed the term plasmoid, which we adopt. It has been possible with a magnetic coupling loop to pick up signals which can be demonstrated to be associated with the magnetic fields trapped by the plasmoid of the type shown in figures 2, and I'll show you the image 3. Note that no external magnetic field was uh, used. Uh, so, okay, so uh, maybe I've got the image here. Okay, maybe it's not there. Uh, this is figure five. Okay, so I'm going to show you figure two. Figure two is... Uh, oh, that's figure three. Oh, that's figure two. <laughs> okay, yeah. So uh, figure figure three down here is showing the uh, emission of the toroidal uh, plasmoid. And it's not so clear because of the half-toning, but uh, uh, you can imagine that this is the 
plasma gun and then you've got the toroid just about to leave the gun following the pulse there. Okay, right. So, uh, like I said, I'm not going to read everything in here, um, although I did highlight some things. So, um, this is his, at this point, and though it's going to be revised in the next presentation, uh, this is the hypothetical detailed structure of the plasmoid, uh, given in figure two, and so you have positive ions on the outside and negative charge in the middle. So this is uh, almost like easy water, and uh, I think that's why it's relevant in a hydrodynamic sense where uh, the hydrodynamic systems become effectively magnetohydrodynamic systems. And I don't know whether it's captured. Oh, no. Yes, it's captured some of my highlighting. Okay, all right. So anyway, you can read this in your own time. I think some useful uh, images here are this one, which is how they determined uh, some of the structure. Uh, basically, they're launching the uh, plasmoids uh, this way. And if, if it's this size, then it will touch the electrodes once this side and this side will touch the electrodes once. If it's this size, it'll touch them twice. You'll get a hit here and here, and then you'll get a hit here and here. So uh, they, they, they changed the pressure in the chamber and that changed the size of the plasmoids so produced. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure why it's not showing my highlighting, but um, so uh, in this case, uh, they showed that sometimes uh, you can have an ejection and it, it forms an elongation. Uh, this is because they, he's got the magnetic field in the middle. And then you get a pinch and it produces uh, two plasmoids uh, that are traveling in the direction. Uh, in this case, uh, he's firing uh, two plasmoids. There's a gun here and there's a gun here. And they're fire uh, launching themselves out. Uh, the mag magnets coming up from the bottom here, let's say. And when they come into the center, they kind of deflect. And here you can see a little bit clearer here. So uh, what they've done is they've changed the magnetic field in the, the center here. And so you've got a, a more of a deflection when you come in here. Now, he hypothesizes here, and we're going to talk about this later, um, that there is a, a sort of shift over and uh, uh, if it gets elongated in this way, uh, you can have a twist and it becomes a kind of infinity type structure. But there's more detail in the next paper that we can talk about. Okay, so in this one, figure 16, uh, which is probably not on this page because, uh, oh yes, it is figure 16 here, uh, shows the result of the same experiment with the impact parameter change. So the, different from this, they've changed the impact parameter uh, maybe they've all uh, rotated one of the um, uh, positive and negative on the launcher. Uh, and so it shows the result of the same experiment set, uh, set up with the impact parameter changed in sign, i.e. the plasmoids pass on the left side and the right side. And this is where it's very, very, very interesting. Look at this structure here. Look at this structure here. Right. Now, hold that structure in mind. And I'm going to show you uh, the next few slides uh, from the main part of the presentation. So give me a second to launch that. Okay, this will do. All right, so um, we remember our OM here. And uh, so we. I, I'm assuming that these are two plasmoids that have come together and so forth. But um, uh, if you can recall, this is from the ultra experiment. And this is from the tungsten that was, that was exposed to... A Mars a gas, okay, in Japan in 2019. Now, when I looked at this in Santa Cruz on Alan Goldwater's uh, Magic Sound Lab SEM, one thing that struck me when I was reviewing this amazing image was something that was coming out of here. 
and we're going to zoom into it, so don't worry that you can't see it right there. But it looked like a strange radiation track. Now, bearing in mind, the first one I'd seen myself personally was in the middle of 2017, looking at the Echo Fuel, and then on in September on the Lion uh, outer part of the crust of the core. Uh, this was on the uh, 3rd of September 2019. I took this SEM. And you can see that beam coming out there. And the weird thing is, is that when I grab this image from uh, an ultra experiment I also noticed there was a kink here and a kink here and when I overlaid the two and I mentioned this before this kink completely lines up or very closely lines up given the fact that there's some perspective differences on these things um, with with this area that the beam is coming out of here so I always wondered what that was I thought it was a strange radiation track but it wasn't until much later and I've got the blow up here that I realized that what was coming out of our um, Vega experiments, and this is in 2021, 20, were these spiraling structures. Okay? Spiraling structures. Spiraling structures. Okay? And where are they coming out from? They absolutely always come out of an exploding plasmoid. Okay, or an exploding coherent matter blob, a ball lightning exploding. And always they are coming out. So here, you can imagine this bloom here and this bloom here and this bloom here is this bloom on the plasmoid, the uh, yin-yang structure, the figure of eight that made this transmutation of this material here. And that from this center point here, whether it's coming from the top or not, I think it's coming from underneath this mass of churned material. It's beaming out. And he explains it, and I, I will go and read the text, but when they're coming together, there is a, a means by which it rotates and it causes it to bend. And so we might have a, a, a reasonable explanation for why the bending occurs, but that this is a pair of uh, exotic vacuum objects or possibly an in, a group that is effectively its own exotic vacuum object spiraling out of this exploding event and this exploding event and this exploding event with different periodicities uh, likely due to their energy is extremely close match to this. And in this case where the damage is occurred to the tungsten it is coming out of the center of this structure. And so where I find this fascinating is that at the very same angle on the one that's above here, if you trace that out, you have this third galaxy here. And so what I'm arguing is that the matter that comes down here gets denatured and it gets fired out as coherent matter, uh, protomatter, prima materia, and it gets to a point where the coherence collapses and it gives rise to the birth of a new galaxy. This galaxy, these pair of galaxies are shooting something out that gives birth to a new galaxy. Yeah? And you can imagine a situation where this propagates and propagates. You need a pair to come together to share and build and suck etheric energy, cohering the co the etheric energy into dense matter and then to gain cohere that and send out its progeny this is yin yang this is the mother the father and this is its child in my view what you're seeing here in my view is maybe a pair in here and it's firing out a coherent matter beam okay this may be a pair in here this is a bar galaxy and it's firing out a beam okay it may be that both of them do this and so that the the actual structure that is the galaxy is something that is procreating it just as humans do just as the birds and the bees do galaxies procreate so Again, you've got a pair here 
and it, it, it's spiraling in. The matter is spiraling in. So I believe these plasmoids, they form whatever. Sound will do it. The iron acoustic waves, whatever the vibration modes in here are self-organizing the matter, are self-organizing the matter into this yin-yang, this structure. And it, it, it is, one is one is the, 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 the maker. It's, it's taking material in predominantly. It's on one side. Um, and and between the other one, the one the other one breaks it, and so it, it, it could be that in the case of uh, one of these, it's predominantly doing making. It shares it to the other one, and then it breaks in. Is it the breaker that sends out the the coherent matter beam, or is it the maker? I don't know, but I do believe that uh, as we showed here. We have silver and heavy atoms over here, and it's made lighter atoms over here. So this is the breaker, and this is the maker. And they always tend to have one on top of the other. This is on top of that. This is on top of that. Yeah, One of these is on top of the other one. I believe that in this galaxy, they're bound together, but one of them is on top of the other one. And it's kind of like I, I said, you have these you have these cohering electromagnetic structures and they come together and they're kind of like that. They're flat. They're in a pair. OK. This is the natural order of the entire universe. You can fight nature and it's just going to make you feel uncomfortable. This is the entire nature of the entire universe. Okay, so we have our pairs. We have our yin-yangs. We have a bar galaxy here. And then we have this structure here. This cannot be a coincidence. Now, in the case of uh, the work of Bostick, you'll see when I read through it in a minute, this is coming from this end and this is coming from this end and they're organized so probably one is a, one is a maker one is a breaker and they move around each other but they link into each other now if you recall we had extreme interactions and he talked about the fact that they like to attract each other but then they don't get too close to each other we, we, you will see that in a minute but if if i go and uh, back to um extreme interactions uh, which is in Coherent Matter Waves Part 2. You'll recall um, in this slide, maybe, that this one's coming up here and it's coming up here and it interacts with this one. Okay, it like sees this one coming up here and it likes to interact with it and then it interacts with it and this one's interacting with that and this one's coming over here and it stops here. And this one starts interacting with this one before it even gets close to it. But they don't actually touch each other. These are flying around each other. Okay. Uh, just by the by, since we're on this one, this is a cardioid. And this is a smaller one and a bigger one. This is a smaller dimple. Okay. But it's got the reverse punch through. This is a bigger one, but it's going in. So one one's doing one way and one's doing the other way. He's got two examples on here. This is uh, Shoulders' work, which is exactly the same pattern we're seeing in all of the other work. But let's get back down to the interactions. It's this image here that we had the extreme interactions, if you recall. So this one, it's, it's gone round, it's come out, it's flying down, this plasmoid, it's flying round, it's flying round. And then this one comes out and in one sixtieth of a second, it orbits and starts to cohere with it. It's nearly in coherence with it. And then this one is coming out and it joins it and it starts flying around. And then you have three of them traveling together. But the third one, it kind of really messes up the synchronicity here. Okay. And they start flying apart. It's like, like the, these two are happy getting jiggity with each other. And, and a new lover came in and kind of miss, messed it all up. And so they're coming out here and then... I talk about this one coming in, it hits here and it orbits around literally just 180 degrees and then it follows on and orbits in the counter uh, orbit rotation once it's gone past it. All of this is telling us very, very important details about how this is actually working. And then this slide uh, for me where the coherent matter has left a track on the stainless steel. I believe it's because it's intensely magnetic and uh, that changes the nature of the material and if you have a magnetic field uh, it will change the polarization of light uh, at, or if the material is changed in such a way um, that, that it interacts with the light in a different way. I believe that's what's going on 
here because the plasmoid was intensely magnetic. I, I believe that if you don't see the witness uh, as a, a, under polarizing light, then it might not be actually a strange radiation track. It might actually just be a three-body interaction. Uh, then in this case, this is the actual coherent matter. Uh, and I've said that it, the reason it's, uh, it appears is that you are seeing the actual uh, glow from the actual atoms uh, regaining their electrons or because it's emitting uh, soft x-rays or whatever uh, it's emitting some high energy photons and that's ionizing the gas in the uh, Boutlier uh, uh, Vega experiment and in Henk urines here this is the uh, material that came out of the beam so this would be the beam of prima materia that goes ahead and gives birth to a new uh, galaxy or a new whatever and it, it might mean you might have to have this happen thousands or millions and millions of times before there's enough matter at a different location for there to be the start of a new uh, galaxy or whatever but when the coherent matter wave collapses we've seen it first in the uh, ultrasonic and plasma flow discharge of uh, um, Suhas Ralkar in India we saw near pure silver structure form we saw this one from uh, the plasma system and we saw a nearly pure uh, um, copper one from the ultra experiment so I'm going to go back to the work of Bostic here okay Okay. So, interaction of plasmoids with one another. Rather interesting and unexpected effects are produced when two plasmoids are projected at one another across a magnetic field. For example, the photographs in figure 15 of the trajectories of two plasmoids show interaction that looks at first sight like an elastic collision of two billiard balls in the center of mass system. F figure 15b, so we're talking about these ones here, 15a, 15b shows another such interaction with larger impact parameter. In this one, figure 16 shows the results of the same experimental setup with the impact parameter changed in sign, i.e. the plasmoids pass the left instead of on the right. More striking effects seen in figure 17 here. Is that figure 17? No, it's figure 18. Where's figure 17? Figure 17 here, okay. Um, uh, can be obtained when two plasmoids are fired at one another when the pressure in the vacuum chamber is raised to about 10 to the minus the th three millimeters of hg these effects become even more spectacular when four sources instead of two are employed okay so this is the i think is this part is it this part yes this is very very interesting this next part explanation of the interaction effects on plasmoids deflecting trajectories shown in Figures 15 and 16 and the spiral trajectory shown in figure 17. Okay, so essentially he's saying here, however, at the pressure of about 10 to the minus 3 millimeters of Hg, presumably most air and and mostly air and deuterium with some pump oil vapor, we can expect some photoionization throughout the chamber. So this is why I'm saying is that you're observing some photoionization in the uh, work here. It's, it's photoionization that's causing these things to be uh, observed. Okay. We would not, however, expect an appreciable effect from collisions between the ions and electrons projected by the source and the residual gas atoms. Okay, ours aren't projected by the source. They're uh, either... An instability is reached in, in the ball lightning or it's ejected some mass uh, but just to keep itself stable. Anyway, uh, in his case, he was effectively ejecting some mass to keep the system stable, um, but from a discharge. <laughs> okay, so um, 
because the mean free path, so the electrons projected by the source and the residual gas atoms, because the mean free path for these collisions is still many times the dimensions of the vacuum chamber and many times the Larmor radio of both uh, positive ions and electrons. The electrons produced by the photoionization can conceivably give rise to currents derived, sorry, derived uh, by the vector E equals minus V times H over C. These currents will, of course, act like an electromagnetic break, reducing V and E progressively. This progressive reduction in E can conceivably give rise to a deflection of V into a spiral trajectory. Give rise to a deflection of V into a spiral trajectory. The increasing integrated illumination from the center of the photographs in figure seven, uh, 17 and 18, so here, uh, is evidence of a diminution in V in, uh, in conjunction with a spiraling of V. The fact that V spirals instead of e e um, executing a circle can be understood by realizing that as V decreases, there will be more photoionization in a given region. The increased photoionization will uh, increase the breaking action and will further reduce V. Thus, the process of reduction in V is expected to be regenerative and the spiral can conceivably result. So what are we... Let's look at this in <laughs> uh, image terms. So what, is, what they're saying is uh, the H is at field is out of the, out of the paper. The Y is here, X is here. You've got uh, the E field from positive to, to negative here, and it's still there. Now, what's happening is there are some electrons from photoionization being produced, and these are the positive ions, and that causes uh, spiraling to occur and also uh, um, this bending to occur. So these two effects could potentially account for what we are observing with our spiraling tracks here and other such observations okay so i think this is as good as an explanation as i've seen and uh, people might want to dig in, in into it and maybe comment on it so um plasmoids are an example Wait for it, wait for it. I'm going to zoom into this. Plasmoids are an example of a large amplitude magnetohydrodynamic phenomenon in a compressible medium. Plasmoids are an example of a large amplitude magnetohydrodynamic phenomenon in a compressible medium. This is a magnetohydrodynamic phenomenon. 100% certainly. All of these things. This mark is caused by a magnetohydrodynamic effect. These marks are caused by magnetohydrodynamic effects. These, these, this was the result of a magnetohydrodynamic effect. This this is our guion. This is the center of the magnetic core. This is the uh, pseudo monopole. This is the monopole flux. These are the monopole flux binding. And this is the equivalent in a hydrodynamic system overlaid uh, with something caused by a magneto hydrodynamic system. The interesting thing is how on earth were this magneto hydrodynamic system and the other one in the lines so stable? Well, actually, I think Bostic gives an answer for that, and we're going to see that in a minute. The spontaneous tendency of an ionized gas in a magnetic field to undergo magnetohydrodynamic oscillations is therefore very likely, uh, if I can do this... <laughs> Example of this natural tendency to form plasmoids. Read that again. The spontaneous tendency of an ionized gas in a magnet magnetic field to undergo magnetohydrodynamic oscillations is therefore very likely an example of this natural tendency to form plasmoids. 
It is possible to apply the knowledge gained concerning the nature of plasmoids to a hypothesized process of galaxy formation, uh, already advanced, where gravitational contraction of ionized plasma across a magnetic field can lead to Taylor instability with resulting jets which should be accelerated toward the center of the gravitational attraction. These Taylor instability jets may be expected to become plasmoids, just as the four um, plasma guns in figure 16 generate four plasmoids. That pro This one here, I guess. No, it's figure 19. Figure 16 is 18. Is this one? No, this one. Uh, that's two. <laughs> um, I think he means this one. Uh, just as the four, I guess, found a mistake in his paper. Um, plasma guns in figure 16 generate four plasmoids that proceed roughly radially inwards. The spiraling towards the center by the proposed Taylor instability plasmoids in ga the galaxy is to be expected as they approach the higher atomic density in the center and they re react on one another. So, what he is saying is that in this process of the material coming together, there will be a higher atomic density in the center of this galaxy, in the center of this galaxy, in the center of this galaxy here, uh, when it forms uh, here, in the center of this galaxy here, there will be a higher atomic density. So things are focusing in, things are focusing in to the center. And things are focusing in to the center. If I click through the various transitions here, so it's focusing into the center there, focusing into the center. Things are focusing into the center, higher atomic density, and then it's firing out what I believe is something that has a higher binding energy. Because it's compressed, it's in a much smaller space. Okay? It's focusing it into the center. It's focusing it into the center. It's focusing it in the center. But if, if one is kind of left hand, it tears matter apart. So, you know, uh, right hand, left, left hand makes matter, right hand destroys matter. Yin yang. Yeah. Okay. What's my comment here? Higher atomic density in the center. Okay, this is uh, with. Uh, okay. Da, 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 da. The initial peripheral component of the velocity of the Taylor instability jets in the galaxy can conceivably be acquired by a process that is just the reverse of that diagrammed in figure 20. With the Taylor instability jets, the velocity, and hence E, will be expected to be initially increasing with a consequent deflection in the proper peripheral direction. Okay, uh, and just down here, uh, well, we will read the fact that this was funded by the Naval Research Laboratory, or were, were uh, valuable discussions with the Naval Research Laboratory. So I do think that it's interesting that prior to this being published, on October the 15th, 1956, uh, that um, there was credit given with discussions to the Naval Research Laboratory. And if you recall, when there was uh, a, in October 2001, there was um, a request for uh, understanding anyone in the world that had ball lightning technology and it was published uh, the report uh, and it's a, it was done by a, a colleague of Hal Puthoff in um, 2002 I believe it was um, they said that uh, basically Ken Shoulders work uh, was one path uh, to pursue and the other one was classified uh, work done in the 1950s and so uh, I was absolutely certain that most of the key parts of this technology were established in the 1950s.
Okay, so we're going to look at the sep second paper, but before we do that, we're just going to have a look at the images. Now, typically in these papers, you will see that uh, less, um, how should we put this? Uh, th these, are, these are half toned images, so you kind of lose some sort of uh, definition on them. But at the end of the papers, they have some more grayscale images, so you can see how this is launched, and maybe this is a stretched torus there. And you can see how this has come out and it's left a trail. Okay, so this this is the equivalent of, of uh, the sort of motion blur that I have. And notice that there's the torus, but it's kind of coming in from one side. It's coming in from one side. So this is equivalent to what we observed in no, uh, no coincidences. Okay, again, this is the deflection, the deflection with a different parameter, higher gauss higher magnetic field this is the one where they're spiraling over each other and similar thing launched from either side and this is where they come together so in c it says here h400 gauss peak current is 2700 amperes here the plasmoids collide and break into fragments so it's coming here and blowing up and bits of the plasmoids are going in a number of directions and you've seen these kind of things in smoke rings actually where the smoke rings uh, there's some YouTube videos where they fire two smoke rings against each other and they, they break up and then you get little smoke rings coming off from that interaction. Okay, so they're a little, little bit easier to see these images than the ones that uh, are half-toned. Okay, this one again, this is the, this is the, you can see the toroid forming here, maybe if I go in a little bit further. Okay. Uh, anything else? Anything else before we go on to the next one? Yeah, this is the elongation and anything else. And these are some timing signals. Okay, all right. So we're going to go on to the 1956 paper. Again, not going to read everything. Sorry, 1957 paper. So this is, uh, there's another one, um, a later one that I've discussed before. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that today, but basically, um, he, his thinking had, had advanced a little bit more and he basically said that all matter from the smallest all the way through to uh, galaxies uh, could be explained by understanding this phenomena. Anyway, this was May the 1st, 1957. So experimental study of plasmoids, Winston H. Bostick at the University of California Radiation Laboratory, Livermore, California. Okay, it was received January 30th, 1957. So a plasma source can be used to, in, uh, to project ionized matter across a magnetic field. The configuration of plasma observed when an electromagnetic breaking action is produced by the presence of low pressure gas in the vacuum, which I've just explained where the, it causes some photoionization and the electrons there, they help cause some breaking leading to spiraling and, and so forth, uh, provides an insight into the manner in which magnetic field lines can be dragged and twisted. By firing several sources simultaneously, it is possible to simulate in geometrical form the production of spiral galaxies and barred spirals. So perhaps if we had done our Vega experiments with really, really good vacuum pumps, we would never have observed these spiral structures. Uh, it's because the vacuum systems of Henk and uh, uh, Urine and De Boutlier were not fantastic. They enabled this photoionization to occur to create the spiraling and, and so forth uh, of, of the plasmoids. And so um, you can imagine how if, if something is being emitted uh, from a intense plasma, uh, uh, compression or, or an explosive event and it's coming through the plasma that's in the environment around it from that high density uh, core then there's going to be that interaction that sets up that spiraling uh, motion going on and so um, you can kind of begin to understand how these uh, tracks that we've observed in the last year can occur and and, and to be fair uh, um Bostick was not seeing these things. He was seeing a very small subset and, and projecting out to what that might mean if you could see more things, <laughs> okay? I, you know, it's it's a testament to his forward thinking of the implications, uh, and you'll see more of it in this paper. 
Okay. So production of a plasmoid in field-free space. The plasma travels as a structure whose form is determined by the magnetic field it carries along with itself. The plasma travels in field-free space in the form of a torus. Okay. And why am I? Okay. The probe traces are consistent with the hypothesis that the plasma is in the form of the torus. Okay, so I'm going to explain what he's talking about, these probe, probe traces. So, in the previous uh, uh, paper, this they had this source generator here, which we talked about, and it produces this torus, which is a li little lopsided. Okay, you get a big bulb and a small bulb at the back. And what they did was, is they had a, um, where is it, where is it, where is it? They, they had a probe, and the probe interacted with this torus, and they got spikes, okay? As the outer side of this hit the probe, they got a spike, and then they got nothing, and then they got another spike. Now, he's saying that the front edge... Of, of the shell of the plasmoid is ill-defined in the way that they make them and as such it produces a fuzzy first spike but the back side this side is much uh, more much better defined and so you get a sharp spike rise and then a fall off okay and then as you go across you then get a sharp spike rise and a fall off and then a sharp spike rise and a fall off okay so, uh, I think I can agree with him. That is the structure of the plasmoid. And he goes on to describe um, what that means. He says here, It has been possible with a magnetic coupling loop to pick up signals that are believed to be associated with the magnetic fields trapped by the plasmoid of the type shown in figures 2, 3, and 4, reference 1. Note that no external DC magnetic field is employed here. Examples of such signals are shown in figure 3, although the structure of these signals is too complex for analysis. Uh, look. These signals are nevertheless experimentally identified with uh, magnetic fields carried by the plasmoid. In the magnetic coupling loop signals, as with the probe signals, the outstanding feature is the steep leading edge, which can in no way be associated with an ordinary shock wave. The steepness of the leading edge of the plasmoid may possibly explain the abrupt onset of magnetic storms approximately 24 hours after a solar disturbance. It is entirely possible that ions and electrons ejected from the sun come to earth in the form of a plasmoid. A very, 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 very large plasmoid. And so you see these events. Okay. So the type of plasmoid to be designated the was that pi one plasmoid uh, uh, because it is unstable. Diagrammed in Figure Four here of reference one is expected to expand in directions of both increasing r. So this is the r from the center to the center of this. And little r from the center of the uh, toroid to the outermost part of the double layer, <laughs> which are respectively large and small radii of the torus. The expected expansion of the pi 1 plasmoid uh, may thus be uh, thought of as a magnetic explosion. A magnetic explosion. Hi, Kim. <laughs> Kim needs the keys. <laughs> no. Oh, have I taken her keys? Let me have a look. No, I haven't got the keys. <laughs> well, Kim needs the keys. Let's. What? What? What keys? What keys do I? Uh, can, can, uh, no, I don't. I don't have your keys. I don't have your keys. I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't have your keys. <laughs> All right. <laughs> 
I, I don't I don't have a I have my keys yes I have my keys yes I have keys yes look there we go I can get back in the house <laughs> right thank you thank you my love <laughs> right uh, yes I've got my keys I've got my keys they're in my pocket thank you guys <laughs> all right uh, uh, brilliant excellent so I can go home I can sleep tonight this is good good it makes change right so um uh, it is possible it, uh, okay so where are we so it is possible to conceive of a plasmoid which at first sight seems to be more stable than the pi 1 plasmoid this plasmoid which we shall designate the s plasmoid is diagrammed in figure 4 so this is the hypothesized more stable one than this and when we look at it it looks remarkably like a cross section through uh, an exotic vacuum object and in fact i might show you my image of this okay right so let's let's go and have a look at this does he does he say any more about the s plasmoid does he say any more about the s plasmoid he just talks about making it no he doesn't say any more there okay all right right does he say any more down here okay this is important this is important here there is a very real possibility that the s plasmoid immersed in an external DC magnetic field would be stable. There is a very real possibility that the S plasmoid immersed in an external DC magnetic field would be stable. Well, guess what, folks? Guess what? These plasmoids... This one here, this collection actually of plasmoids and this collection of plasmoids was on this surface and there was quartz on the outside of this and then there was a solenoid running around it. Which means that there was a DC magnetic field. One could argue that the, um, the ones that are on the outside of the reactor uh, which we have here around the outside of there, there's you can see the the solenoid cantal wire that goes round and it goes round into a helix in fact it goes round to a helix much like this one on the lion 4 okay which apparently this one was live and so we're going to have a deep dive on this at some point there was two live reactors in line four. Okay, so you've got a helix around here, and there will be a magnetic field going through that. So this plasmoid was actually inside a magnetic field. This one, however, was kind of like on the tail end, so that it, it's kind of like the opposite end of this. But you can imagine it would be here, but it was actually at the other end. Okay, so there's a magnetic field going here. So I always thought that when we looked at this one it was this way with the magnetic field through the center of the solenoid and this one was on the top okay but still in line with the center this is literally the center between these two is the center of the magnetic field of that solenoid that's why it could not be a coincidence it could never be a coincidence for me that these formed in these very 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 specific positions and in in addition the center of this bit of the wire was over the center of this structure that is not a coincidence that that is that all happened for a reason so yeah there is a very real possibility that the s plasmoid immersed in an external ma dc magnetic field would be stable okay right so i want to show the model here uh, that I have of maybe it maybe I wasn't showing you the page then uh, anyway um, uh, what I was talking about was uh, this one is in this angle and uh, this one is here this is in the center 
center of the magnetic field through the solenoid. This one was in the center here of the magnetic field, but it's over to one side, but it was still in the center line. So there's no doubt in my mind that uh, these plasmoids, however they occurred, uh, were able to be stable and grow and grow and grow and do the respective damage here because they had a relationship with the magnetic field there. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my presentation because I've done something in the main making galaxies. And so I've taken here his diagram from Bostic 1956-57. Uh, okay, this is the S plasmoid, so that might be might need to be 1957. Um, and this is the torus I had from my uh, uh, simulation with our double layer here. So this is the double layer here, and because this is a cross section so that he's cut the donut in half and we're kind of looking at it with a bit of perspective okay this is looking at it top down but I'm, I've not cut it in half or you could say I've cut it in half but it doesn't really matter and so the thinnest amount of double layer you look through is where you are perpendicular to the surface yeah uh, so that is why this is the darkest you're looking through increasingly more and then when you're looking at the edge, that is where you get the maximum amount of double layer you look through. So you, you basically don't have to cut this uh, um, to, to see the double layer. This is one that has no spin for whatever reason uh, from Boutelier. Uh, and uh, you can see it's just it's almost like an elongated tube in this 1 60th of a second movement. It's obviously very, very fast. And what I did was I used uh, Lightwave 3D from NewTek, uh, as I've shown you before. And I took this structure and I moved it over uh, a distance. And I turned on uh, the uh, blurring, the, the, uh, the function on the software that allows uh, effectively one frame to uh, show many, many subframes. So it's like like persistence of vision on the eye. So it's equivalent to the the aperture being open as it was in this. And so this is the simulated structure, and this is the the observed structure uh, based on this torus. But the torus is uh, kind of like rotated, so it's kind of like rather than flat on, it's kind of like at an angle like that, and it's flying uh, across the camera's uh, lens. And uh, it's using the same sort of structure here with this uh, double layer going on. Okay. So, uh, moving on. It has already been demonstrated that plasmoids can be projected across a magnetic field. It is quite possible that an iron ionized material ejected from the surface of the sun proceeds and escapes across the magnetic field of the sun in the same manner that laboratory produced plasmoids cross a magnetic field. These plasmoids bear very little re resemblance to the S plasmoids and move so rapidly as to make instantaneous photography very difficult if not impossible. However, these plasmoids leave a wake or a track which enables us to photograph the, with their path easily. That's kind of what I'm doing here. That's kind of what I'm doing here. This is the photograph of the track. This isn't something that is this long. It's the track. Okay. That is what's happening when we are looking at these. This is the track. But because of the the iron and the, the photo ionization and the interaction with the photo ionization, uh, if we take on board what uh, Bostic has said, that is why that is occurring. Okay. Uh, I don't want to go there. It is further observed that these plasmoids experience an electromagnetic breaking action which decelerates and deflects them when they encounter one another or when they travel through gas at pressure. So here we go. That deflects them when they encounter... Uh, sorry, breaking action which decelerates and, de and deflects them when they encounter one another. 
Indeed, several of these plasmoids can be made to spiral in consort to produce a ring of plasma. The organic relationship, uh, sorry, the organic relation between this laboratory observed process and the evolution of spiral galaxies and stars has already been suggested. So what you are seeing in the extreme interactions uh, uh, that I showed and also I repeated in um, uh, my presentations in Azizi is these kind of uh, where they are deflecting each other. They are attracting and deflecting each other. Attracting, de deflecting, 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 yeah? Deflecting each other. This is deflecting, yeah? This this one actually comes up here and, and bounces over that one. <laughs> but of course, it's it, it's weird because it's like a, it's like a magnetic beam, yeah? So it's it it's either in front of it or behind it. In this case, this is coming from here, coming up here. It points its magnetic beam before it, and that influences this one. Um, so there we go. So you can see there's two coming together here and the, what this is actually with these images, this is the fronton image and this is a stereoscopic image from either side. So there's a, a distance between the two cameras that took these two images at the same time as this one. Or maybe it's one lens that does a kind of weird split so that you can get some sort of stereoscopic perspective on it by looking at the one on the left and the right. Yeah. But the, the one in the middle is where the action is occurring. So you can see the plasmoids, which we know are a toroid, and the tail, which is it's kind of like uh, the, the way that it's leaving a trail behind it. It isn't its actual form. It's just the trail that it leaves. They come together and then they're merging, but they are effectively like two donuts. They're coming together like like this. Like, oh, God, I haven't got enough space, have I? Uh, they're coming together like this. <laughs> I can use my, my magnets, can't I? <laughs> In theory, they're coming together like this and then they kind of snap together and then they kind of spin around. Yeah? <laughs> okay. So here we go. We're coming to the barred spirals here. And I think it's not a bad description. I think it's not quite like this, but I quite I do like how he's um, saying this. So barred spirals. One of the relatively simplest results that must be understood is the barred spiral, which is produced by firing two sources at one another across a magnetic field. Over a wide range of variation of parameters, the two plasmoids seem to seek each other out unerringly. So they're always trying to go and attract each other. The sequential stereoscopic photographs of figure five show the process of production of these barred spiral structures. So figure five, I'm actually going to see if I can find figure five. Here. There's figure five, and this is a better quality. This is from lower down in the paper where they, they don't have the ones. So... They're coming together, coming, this is the center line rather than stereoscopic. Center line, they're coming together, they're coming to, they, they find each other and they start uh, grouping and they form this S. Well, isn't that a thing? We've seen that S a lot. Is, the, is this what it really is or is this just how it appears like this? Okay. It can be seen from figure five that the leading edges of the two plasmoids seem to seek and attach themselves to each other. The same process can be observed in figure six. So figure six, figure six is here. So, okay, so it's coming together, joining, and then almost looks like they're orbiting around or something. Where the pressure is one micron, where the bond between the two plasmoids apparently does not hold as well as in figure five. The photographs of figure six also show the interesting feature that the tails of the spiral arms become forked. Okay, so he's saying that there's a fork here and there's a fork here. Okay, it's maybe not very clear. 
it would be lo lovely to have the original photograph. So, so it's two coming together, coming together, but they don't quite uh, lock arms. And you can see there's a bit of forking going on here, a bit of forking going on here. Okay. And he explains this. Uh, in fact, maybe I will take the explanation from here. So, furthermore, the stereoscopic photographs, figure five, six, and seven, five, six, and seven down here, which are very, very clear, like, well, like these ones. Five, six, and seven. Okay. Uh, and eight. Where's eight? Eight's here, eight's here, okay, that's figure eight. Show that the plasmoid in proceeding across the magnetic field at these fairly high pressure assumes the form of a helix of progressively increasing diameter. These particular helixes are all left-handed screws because the DC magnetic field was always in the same direction. The photographs of figure 5, 6, 7 and 8 give us enough information to suggest that the configuration of plasma and magnetic field when one plasma source is fired across a magnetic field is that shown in figure 9, which is that one, is it? No, that's 10. Uh, figure 9 is here. Okay, so 9. So they're saying that it, it forms this type of structure. Okay. And what what does this what does this structure look like? I mean, can, can we can we just just appreciate that it kind of looks like this, doesn't it? Doesn't it? I mean, does it? Does this structure here? Does this look a little bit like this? I think it might. I think there's a pretty good chance that it does look a little bit like that. Does it look like these? Does it does it look like these? I don't know. Does it look like this one here? I don't know. But I would definitely say that this structure here, this structure here is a absolute absolute dead ringer for what Bostic is showing here. Okay. <clears throat> As I will say again, it is now possible to see how two plasmoids fired at one another across a magnetic field can stretch themselves into each other. Oh, have I said the wrong thing here? Uh... Okay, so uh, the photographs five, six, seven give us enough information to suggest that the configuration of plasma, this one here, and magnetic field, when one plasma source is fired across a magnetic field, is that shown in figure nine, this one. Uh, eventually, it may be possible to analyze this process quantitatively. For the moment, a description by a drawing will have to suffice. It is now possible to see how two plasmoids fired at one another across a magnetic field can attach themselves to each other as shown in figure 10. Such a plasma, uh, plasma magnetic field configuration can also explain the forked tail on each plasmoid seen very clearly in figure 6. Apparently, if the leading loops of the two plasmoids have twisted into such a position that no st stagnation point is reached, the plasmoids studiously avoid one another as shown in figures 7 and 8. So figures 8, they, they're, they're there, but they avoid each other. They keep a distance from each other. They're there, but they avoid each other. They keep a distance from each other. Now, I quite like this description here. After the union of the two plasmoids has been accomplished, as in figures 5 and 6, the angular momentum will wind them up into a spiral to a certain extent until the angular momentum has been brought to zero. I'm going to read you something from somewhere else in a little bit later. 
by the stretching of the field lines. The resultant plasma and magnetic configuration then seems to be stable. The barred spirals have been followed in time out to 15 seconds, at which time at which they still preserve their shapes with well-defined boundaries. Furthermore, the plasma does not seem to migrate in the direction of the original DC magnetic field. It is rather astonishing that such a bizarre configuration of plasma and magnetic field should appear to be stable. No theoretician known to the author has a priori dreamed of such a configuration to say nothing of contemplating its stability. So what he's saying is these structures here, which we have clearly seen absolutely certainly here without a shadow of a doubt in the Vega experiment here, lead to when you have two of them coming together this is his argument suggested configuration of the plasma and magnetic field existing in the formation of a barred spiral the stagnation point produced when the two leading loops of the plasmoids approach one another permits the lines of force to leap from one plasmoid to another carrying plasma across and tying the two plasmoids together so what they're saying is these two and bearing in mind you've got the field coming in here around that way and this one's coming around that way so is that that way and this is still that way but this is twisting under and twisting over um, they don't touch each other but they share uh, the field lines the magnetic um, where is it saying the, the stagnation point produced when the two leading loops of the plasmoids approach one another permits the lines of force to leap from one plasmoid to another carrying plasma across uh, and tying the two plasmas together so there we go so there's some sort of link now is is that kind of similar thing now obviously these are not um how should we put this they're not uh, fully wound up at this point but if these were to become two toroids and become in a very st stable position relatively could we have a situation where we are seeing this is this here a torus is this a torus and this a torus and they have an interaction that keeps them stable they don't want to come together but they they, they don't want to be apart okay and is that the same sort of thing that you're seeing in this acoustical hydrodynamic or magnetohydrodynamic but definitely hydrodynamic in this case system and is it something similar to what happens in this system okay but they actually offset the way they kind of don't interlink is by by doing this <laughs> as i've said before they're kind of always like that one is definitely on top of each other this is what we observe in lion this is what we observe in the system of uh, matsumoto from 1996 from his lead wire experiments etc etc add infinitum okay so he's doing the case of launching these together what we've done in so many experiments has shown that if you keep resonantly pumping and resonantly pumping and resonantly pumping and feeding it more and feeding it more and focusing that energy on those nodes in that cohering process that it's not a one-off it's not a one event it's it's driving the system it's driving the system okay so reading this last bit here, after the union uh, of the two plasmoids has been accomplished, as in figures five and six, the angular momentum will wind them up into a spiral to a certain extent until the angular momentum has been brought to zero by the stretching of the field lines. The resultant plasma and magnetic configuration then seems to be stable. The barred spirals have then been followed in time out to 15 seconds, la la la. Okay, now what he talks about is when the systems can join into rings okay so he says production of rings we must now try to understand at least in a qualitative way how rings or tori can be produced by plasmoids measurements already reported show that with four plasma sources a ring can be produced which apparently maintains its shape for at least 30 seconds moreover it is observed that this ring does not move or stretch appreciably in the direction of the dc magnetic field during the this time interval the magnetic field configuration in the ring must therefore 
be such as to confine the plasma in this fairly stable ring. It has been possible to produce a ring with only two... Where are we? Uh, with only two... Oh, we're going down here, are we? Sources. But the ring, products, ring product is flattened. In fact, as time goes on, the ring configuration develops a constriction and flips over into a figure eight. Okay? <laughs> flips over into a figure eight. Figure 12 suggests that a plasma magnetic field configuration to explain the ring shown in figure 11. It ha is readily understandable that a flattened ring formed by tightly twisted strands will constrict in the center and form a figure eight. It can be seen from the hypothesis in figure 12 that we might actually expect two rings, one formed from each strand, but that they are topologically intertwined. So this is what he's saying. You have two things coming together. They form one ring and those are topologically intertwined, but they form a figure of eight. Okay. And so this is kind of going round here and round here and round here and round here. It's actually a ring that's interspersed with itself, with the other one. And this one's going round. So one is going round one way. Okay. That ri the, the one that I'm going round now is genuinely like an infinity loop. Yeah. Okay. Whereas this one is orbiting round it in, you know, with it almost the double the per periodicity. Yeah. And I can actually show you something. If you look at the question mark over a tadpole, on, on the question mark, there is a spiral orbiting around that structure. And I, I'm pretty certain that that... In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and find that because it's, it's always interested me from when I saw that so many moons ago. This is from the analysis of the internal product of line two. So let me find that. Uh, I'll find it. Yeah, maybe. No, I'm going to find it here. Give me a second. Yeah, th this is understandable, Stephen. It really is. Um, and the, the fact that we now have methods by which we can repeatedly produce extremely high quality video of these things in action and with taking on board the insights of what uh, Bostick and his team had done in the 1950s and modernizing those experiments, we can really better understand what's going on. And the fact that it occurs in hydrodynamic systems as well uh, is just mind-blowing. And, and when you see the, 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 the boom at the end of this presentation, um, uh, which blew me away, which I only read for the first time uh, 24 hours ago, less five minutes than right now. Um, uh, it, it blew me away. So I hope, hopefully I haven't lost the link, but anyway, we'll get there. Um, <laughs> uh, what was I looking for? Uh, oh, I was looking for that, wasn't I? Uh, Okay, so I always thought this was amazing uh, when I saw it, and I, I couldn't explain it at the time. Uh, but I think it's because the, whatever that produced this was 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 something similar to the kind of things we're discussing here, and I'm I'm sure at some point that'll that'll be very very clear. So, and and it's just funny because I it, it will correlate to two galaxies today which I never knew had a name. And I've not really been into a, a astronomy much and at all, really. Um, so this is, you know, just seeing what we see in the experiments and cross-correlating. Cross and anyway, th this was um, a question over a tadpole. And there's this structure here. And I always found it, found it highly amusing that you had the main thing here and then you had this orbiting around it, orbiting around it, this, this substructure. So it are these two uh, plasmoids of different intensities or, or whatever? I don't know, but I, I found that very interesting. And then this is a ball with a tail, a ball with a tail. So 
and they're they're both quite close to each other in in their form but yeah this this thing of consistent uh, um, radii but 50 percent uh inside this structure i always found that absolutely fascinating anyway that's my little aside i didn't think i was going to say that today but i i did <laughs> Okay, so you've got these things going around each other. Now, if you look at, um, uh, where is it, on the, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. one thing I always found interesting is in the this particular structure here is that you, you could see absolutely certainly there were two... Um, bands there's one here and there's one here and look if you look this is kind of like going around there is it going around and coming around the outside is this going around there and coming around there is this going around here is there some sort of spiraling going on i don't know but we did see if you recall on those uh videos the the high frequency videos that i took in the um the uh ultra experiments it did look like there was spiraling going on around the figure of eight so maybe maybe it's all the same thing like, like i say when that's happening in that figure of eight there is easy water there is um uh, cavitation going on so you're going to get charged particles in there and so yeah, you're going to see a situation where it's kind of acting like a uh a, 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 a plasmoid but it's, it's just adding magneto hydrodynamic in a hydrodynamic system the, the 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 speed at which they form here so like so you can do the remediation of nuclear waste by using the magneto hydrodynamic that forms in the hydrodynamic system of the vibration systems that in my view is why it works uh for the uh, mars vibrator but it doesn't form as quickly this being a plasma forms incredibly quickly but it might need maybe a magnetic field to keep it stable uh, but be because this forms and then breaks you know you could see how instantaneously it cut through that uh, 10 yen coin and left the all the signatures of the ball lightning the coherent matter structure in there so the, the the remediation speed at which this occurs is not one month to do two half lives. It's basically, according to Yule Brown, ninety six to ninety nine ninety eight percent in a few seconds uh, or minute, not not months. And I believe that the, because the ability of the compressibility and the coherence and the uh, and I'll, I'll talk about this with some other presentation probably during the week um, from the Bitchkoff work where he hypothesizes that the, the, the pair, the yin-yang the structure, leads to a, um, how should we put this? It leads to uh, an exponential increase in the, the, the vorticity. So if you've got to imagine one, one is compressing down into a point, cohering matter, and it feeds that coherent matter into the other one, which is also pulling material in. And that coheres that matter plus the material it's just received and then it feeds it to the other one and it goes round in a loop compressing more and more matter so it, it, it and it basically goes up exponentially <laughs> it's an exponent so there we go he, he says that and i believe that's what we're seeing until uh, it becomes unstable with whatever system of stability it has and it fires out this beam it fires out this beam and this plasmoid that did this which this is the witness mark of did the same thing that this plasmoid did and this is the video of this witness mark this plasmoid did this which would be the video of this plasma uh, plasmoid uh, sorry strange radiation track and i believe that it's cutting through here and i bear this concept in mind because the binding energy of what came through here is higher than the matter it's traveling through so it it it, it, it does weird stuff to matter it, it just eats it for breakfast yeah okay uh, let's go back to bostic okay uh where are we yeah so you've got the the toroids forming here from four injection points and again in this uh presentation he will have later on have i got it for, is that from that is from 1957 so uh he will have these later on in b better quality here so you can see this from eight injection points 
This is from eight injection points. This is the, there, so that's that one there, but not not in uh, that quality. Okay, so you can see here. All right. Okay. <sighs> Where were we? Production of rings. Figure twelve. Uh, okay. We'll go back to this. Figure 12 suggests a plasma magnetic field configuration to explain the ring shown in figure 11. Uh, it is readily understandable that the flattened ring formed by tightly twisted strands will constrict in the center and form a figure 8. It can be seen from the hypothesis 12 uh, on figure of figure 12 that we might actually expect two rings, one formed from each strand, but they are topologically intertwined. As has already been reported, it is possible to form rings by firing four sources. It is believed that these rings have essentially the same structure as the ring shown in figure uh, 11 and 12, except that they are initially circular instead of flattened and uh, have more angular momentum. Therefore, we may expect the rings formed by four sources to have a tendency to preserve their circular shape instead of flipping into a figure 8. And so, uh, and when I say flip, flipping, it might be literally that they are two monopoles coming together and, and one kind of flips just to be aligned with it, you know, like, like that. <laughs> these, these coming together and uh, they just go like that. Wait. <laughs> um, whereas if you have more of them, they arrange with their poles in a ring. Yeah. Uh, as I said, with the uh, three tier... Um, uh, exotic vacuum object structure. Okay, so uh, for, for the sake of uh, saying so, uh, if, if people don't know my ring, it's basically the Chill Bolton Observatory. And uh, if you go to what, what that is, I will find it for you here. Um, Give me a sec. So this is the famous Chill Bolton Observatory crop circle, uh, which I shared uh, is the tail end of my uh, presentation slide in Sochi in 2018. And this is it. So the first stable structure is, uh, it's, it's all made by the Evo. And the first stable structure is two. Uh, and they, they share material between them. Okay. And then it's a fractal structure of the same thing. So this is, this is the most basic structure that you can make anything from yep uh, there we go <laughs> and they probably thought i was a bit bonkers when i shared that at the end of my sochi 2018 presentation but i don't think i am uh, and that's that <laughs> that's all i'll have to say about that then <laughs> okay so uh yeah the, the the ring in the spot is the ring in the spot that you see here yeah it's the ring and the the, the the ring in the spot here but it's it's these two the two and they they share the material between them the two and they share the material between them okay the the two yeah and this beautiful image from bin Wang huang's work at the national taiwan university okay so back to our man not this one so uh where do we go uh, I think that's mostly what I wanted to say about that. Uh, by firing simultaneously two or more plasmoids across a magnetic field, it has been possible to produce cooperative phenomena, which in geometrical form suggest the simulation of the production of spiral galaxies and astronomical barred spirals. There is hence some promise that it will be possible to study these astronomical processes in the laboratory. I think we can. 
I think that's exactly what we've been doing for the last four years. Absolutely, we've been doing that with simple and relatively inexpensive experiments culminating in ultra experiment, which is about as simple as you can do to produce uh, barred spiral type galaxy structures. Furthermore, the plasma and magnetic field configurations produced in the laboratory are of themselves a considerable f physical importance. Yes, yes, I think they are. Right. Now, what can they do? Here is Bin Zhuen Huang. He has copper, oxygen obviously in the water. And uh, he sees carbon increasing on here. Where's the carbon coming from? And if you keep putting hydrogen into carbon, you, uh, sorry, into oxygen, you will end up with carbon. It's called the CNO cycle. But also he is seeing the production of silicon here on this spot. Of course, we observe the same thing, but it's nice to look at someone else's work. And why is silicon important? Well, if you fuse 12 carbon and 16 oxygen, you end up with 28 silicon. Silicon is the second most abundant element in the Earth's crust. Oxygen is the most abundant element in the Earth's crust. When we get these crenellated spheres that are produced, when we get these crenellated spheres that are produced in the Nova experiment, in natural ball lightning in Histalin, in the Vega experiment, and in the Ultra experiment, predicted and found the first time of looking, they have an iron and oxygen core. Eh, let's call that a planetary core. And then they have silicon and oxygen a little bit on the outside. Let's call that the crust. And then on the outside that, they have a bit of carbon, don't they? It's a planet maker. <laughs> it's a planet maker. The core of these things spits out planets or these structures spit out planets. Okay subunits of them. When a ball lightning in Uroitskev's experiment blows up, it forms little ones which are self-similar. You know. So, we are going to look at the cardioid here that I've shown you before. And this is in Cl Thomas Clater's work that where he was working with Roger Stringham. Roger Stringham has done 30 years of ultrasonic experiments mostly with 22 kilohertz then 43 46 kilohertz around the the ones that we've been doing with ultra experiments and then more latterly they collaborated and they did 1.7 megahertz experiments and this was published in 2019 long after i grabbed that image of these two galaxies potentially giving birth to another one and this is silver at two percent and palladium Palladium with a silver uh, alloy of 2%. And after they ran it uh, for several two-minute runs in deuterium oxide, heavy water, at 30 watts, 1.7 megahertz, they synthesized oxides of, so it obviously includes oxygen, sodium, potassium, aluminium, calcium, magnesium, silicon, chlorine, sulfur, and phosphorus from this. Okay, now I said that this is a cardioid. They stripped this material off and underneath they found a very much more defined cardioid. This is palladium and silver. This is palladium coated on steel in a Mars's thing with our cardioid structure on it. Well, I've already showed you the synthesized elements on here in a vortical structure. This is on the outside of the lion jewel structure. We have a cardioid here with the, the overlaying vortices there. This is on the ultra experiment. This is the one on the Parkamov experiment where you can see the two bands in the material going around and uh, on the outside. Okay, synthesized elements here, synthesized elements here, not determined, not determined, synthesized elements here. Now the interesting thing is this is lopsided. And when you are using palladium, uh, palladium is like in silver they're all like over a hundred nucleons yeah sodium 23 potassium uh you know uh not 23 aluminium's 27 cal cal calcium is uh 40 magnesium's 
24, silicon's 28, chlorine's whatever it is, uh, sulfur, sulfur and so on, 32, uh, phosphorus 31, chlorine, they're not necessarily in the right order, but there they are. Um, okay, so these are much lighter elements than the palladium and the silver. So when they are go through the ringer, when they go through this, the cohering forces at the center of this figure of eight here that produces this cardioid structure, they spit out nucleons which then regain their electrons and form this encrustation. He, they call it an eruption in the paper. And because the atoms uh, have a larger atomic volume, it's larger than the material that disappeared. Where have we seen this before? Well, we saw it in the very simple lead wire experiments of uh, Dr. Takaaki Matsumoto. And hopefully, next week, we will publish the final one-for-one -one copy of the book. Uh, it's nearly all scanned and cleaned up, so uh, you can look forward to that. And there's lots of material I want to go through with that, which are, is very important to how uh, these experiments move forward and what we've experienced in Vega experiments and so forth, and in even the electrolysis experiments. But anyway, so like we see here, a small amount of palladium with a little bit of 2% silver has disappeared. And it's produced this large encrustation of atomic nuclei that have a larger atomic volume than the starting material. In this case, the lead is 204, 206, 207, 208. And this ejects from its pole a lot of material. And this is carbon. Okay, And we observe the same phenomena coming out of indium. Now, I showed you a structure on the tungsten that was exposed by David Boutlier based on our ultrasonic uh, concept uh, in Canada. And I said, it looks a bit like the cardioid uh, on the Stringham Clater paper. And here it is. And all I've done is I've rotated it. And uh, you can see that it has this arm out here. It has this arm out here. It has this central section that bends over. It has this central section that bends over. It has the oval cardioid shape overall cardioid shape and it's distorted off to one side and this is the thing that's above and this is the below one this is the above this is the below one this is the above this is the below one so this is spewing material out and this is pushing it around the other side okay now if we look at the element synthesized at, at, with alan goldwater at his, uh, that he sorry that he observed uh, at his magic sound lab with his sem uh, you can see these various spectrums here so the 2292 here is the raw material outside of this cardioid structure. And that is by atomic concentration, so it would be much more by weight. It's 16.73 tungsten uh, and 57.26 oxygen. So tungsten forms W2O3. Okay, so there's a lot of oxygen relative to the tungsten. And here you've got carbon. Okay, so this is just what's on the outside. It, I would expect that some of this carbon would have been atoms deposited from this structure uh, coming outside of its zone. And I would believe that if you took this structure off, you would find something similar to this underneath it. Yeah, if you could do that. Okay, I predict that that would be the case. But what do we see? What do we see? We see sodium. Magnesium, aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, potassium, calcium. What do we see here? Sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, potassium, calcium. And because we're starting with a much heavier element, we also see titanium and iron. Yeah? So, uh, essentially... This is not only a re replication of what we observed in uh, Japan, it's also a replication of something. This is plasma on a heavy element. This is magnetohydrodynamic driving plasma system on a heavy element, synthesizing the same light crust forming elements. And what do we see on the plasmoid that I believe caused this explosion, this coherent matter process? We look at the, pro the, the plasmoid here, we see... Sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, potassium, calcium. Okay. What do we see on the tungsten that we did in 
the uh, Amaza. So I've got the two two shots here. Those two shots. We see sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, sulfur, potassium, calcium, and then it's tungsten. So we see the titanium and the iron. Predicted, uh, observed in one experiment and replicated in a different experiment uh, with the same type of structure as we see here. So this would be, in my view, the kind of structure that you would see underneath this. Yeah, you got the the what is it? The uh, oh god, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost over here. Yeah. So th there's there's your three things. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, I think probably uh, that's most of what I wanted to say today. <laughs> um, uh, so let me just see. So actually it's not. There's, there's the one thing that I, I think is very important to get across. And I've got it somewhere. I need to find it. So the first thing is, what determines binding energy? The smaller the size of a bound system, the higher its associated binding energy. The smaller the size of a bound system, the higher the, its associated binding energy. The gravitational binding energy of an object, such as a celestial body, is the energy required to expand the material to infinity. Okay? So, as material goes into the centre of our structure, its binding energy is going up. Now, I'm just going to read you an article. This is from October the 21st, 1999. This is the first thing that I read uh, just over a day ago, uh, 20 minutes more than a day ago, uh, when I thought, well, I better find out what a barred galaxy is. All right. So I'm going to read this to you. Not now. I don't want to do that. I want to go like that. All right. What process creates and maintains the beautiful spiral arms around a spiral ga galaxies? I've been told that density waves are responsible. So where do the density waves come from? Before delving into the answer, it is important to note that spiral arms of galaxies are not fixed solid objects. Rather, they are patterns of bright stars and gas clouds within the overall form of the galaxy. The space between the spiral arms is not empty and stars can move in and out of the arms as they orbit through the galaxy. So Art Ray Carlsberg uh, in the astronomy, de astronomy department of the University of Toronto sent this description of what scientists know about the nature of spiral galaxies. The basic, phys basic physics of why galaxies have spirals is known, but the details remain controversial. So there's an opportunity, guys, for you to use these simple experiments that we've been doing and make these things uncontroversial. Sometimes intensely so. Basically, we don't know what we're talking about. Spirals exist only among flattened or disk galaxies. Wow, kind of like these. These galaxies are differentially rotating. That is, the time to complete a full rotation increases with the distance from the center. With, uh, with the distance from the center, differential rotation causes any disturbance in the disk to wind up into a spiral form. The trouble with this simple explanation is it uh, is that. Uh, the differential rotation would cause spiral features to wind up too quickly, so galaxies would not look like spirals for any appreciable length of time. The second important piece of physics for understanding spiral structure is that the stars and gas in the disk of the galaxy exert an appreciable gravitational force. The force helps maintain the spiral form against the tendency to wind up. Almost everyone agrees on this basic, basic physics. So. Do these things that we are creating in plasma, is it, is it some kind of gravitational force that is preventing them from collapsing? Well, when Matsumoto is describing 
the process uh, of destruction of nucleons in the um, his technology, his uh, research, he says ultimately it's a gravity decay. So we can bear that in mind. So why do disk galaxies often have spiral shapes? There is observational evidence that nearby companion galaxies or or an asymmetric bar-shaped concentration of mass can drive a spiral wave in the disk of the galaxy. Disks that lack such forcing features are the tricky ones to explain. One explanation centers on the fact that gravitational systems act to increase their central binding energy. One explanation centers on the fact that, the gravi that gravitational systems act to increase their central binding energy. Spiral arms remove angular momentum from the center of the galaxy, allowing it to achieve a state of higher binding energy. Spiral arms remove angular momentum from the center of the galaxy, allowing it to achieve a state of higher binding energy. What did I say? Bearing in mind I've been saying it for a long time. I'm saying that what is coming out of here is a coherent matter wave and that this is a lot of matter coherent and it's it's got a high, high, high binding energy. Much more than normal matter. And that's why it can interact with matter and leave strange radiation tracks and it's also highly magnetic. That's why it interacts and leaves polarization effects. Okay? So where would this be the highest? It would be the highest in the center. And what would lead that to be high? Well, according to that theory is this spiral arm removes angular momentum leading to higher binding energy. In my view, this is all working on the same scale. There are two, uh, sorry, on every scale rather. There are two main re versions of the spi uh, theory of spiraling, one of which uh, the waves are steady and long lived, the other of which spirals are transient features that come and go. The natural but not very easy test to observe spiral galaxies for a few hundred million years and see what happens, right? So, yeah, so they're saying we, we can we can prove or disprove this if we watch spiral galaxies for a few hundred million years and see what happens. Well, I think that you could conduct some Vega experiments and you could see uh, the, the kind of things that you see or some ultra experiments and do some deep learning on what's going on with those and probably come up with a much uh, faster idea of whether your theory is correct or not. Most spiral arms, this is Deborah M. Elm Green, Miriam Mitchell, Professor at Astronomy at Visa College, Bruce Elmer Green, for, what? Uh, and Bruce Elmer Green, staff scientist at Watson Research Center. Okay. Most spiral arms in galaxies are density waves, which are compression waves, like sound. Wow. Most spiral arms in galaxies are density waves, which are compression waves, like sound that travel through the disk and cause a piling up of stars and gas at the crest. The wave is temporarily sustained by the force of its own gravity, but it eventually wraps up or gets absorbed at orbital resonances. Places where random stellar oscillations have the same period as the local wave. In some galaxies, a large central bulge can prevent the wave from reaching a resonance. The wave then reflects off the bulge, giving rise to a giant standing spiral wave with a uniform rotation rotation rate and a lifetime of perhaps 10, 5 to 10 disc rotations, roughly 1 to 2 billion years. In all cases, the stars and gas rotate around the galaxy's centre faster than uh, than the wave in the inner parts of the disk and slower than the wave in the outer parts. So it's a resonance, but it's a spiral resonance according to this theory. And Bostick said they reflect off each other. They're saying that they reflect off each other. 
I'm saying this is vibration. It's all vibration. It's sound. And uh, whatever way you think about it. And so the fact that here you have these spiraling coming in to these two things which are kind of like they want to be together but they don't want to be together. They want to be together but they don't want to be together. But they do form a central bulge. And the central bulge manifests itself here. The central bulge manifests itself here. Here, it's all coming together quite nicely. <laughs> um, this differential rotation forces a gas to enter the wave at high speed in the inner regions, causing it to shock and form long, thin dust lanes in each spiral arm. Some density wave galaxies like M81 have highly symmetrical spiral arms. Others like M101 have several arms and less overall symmetry. The difference between these two cases relate, is related to the symmetry of the perturbation that forms formed the arms in the first place and to the relative importance of standing wave patterns which tend to be st symmetric. Okay, let me just see if there's anything else useful here. Density waves are, uh, okay, density waves have many possible origins. A large central bar, such as is seen in NGC 13300, may drive a two-arm density wave for a relatively long time, eventually causing the gas in the outer disk to move outwards and wrap into a giant ring at the edge of the galaxy's disk. A companion galaxy can also generate a two-arm spiral by tidal forces. Such tidal arms probably uh, last only for several uh, rotations before they either wrap up and disappear or initiate a longer-lived standing wave. Well, I can say that when you watch these experiments, what, what is interesting is that this is the witness mark and it's fixed. So the spirals are not moving around. They, they, they are in the positions they are in. Uh, and so this is why I think in the center you have this offset structure uh, of these two toroids. And so they, they lend themselves to, to kind of producing this, this structure. Um, but they, they persist and they're persisting here. This hasn't, the whole material hasn't been spun around. Something happened in the middle here that might be spinning around. Or it's spinning around here and spinning around here maybe in the opposite direction. Uh, but these things, you know, it's pulling material in or whatever. Or shock waving in and out. Um, but it's, it's it, they are located in very specific uh, positions. Very uh, specific positions. Very... When you turn this reactor on, these things appear in exactly the same place every time. Yeah? Uh, if you change the voltage and the current, then they move around. But uh, with the same parameters, they, they uh, rapidly form the same structure. Okay. Uh, the Whirlpool galaxy, M51, has companion-triggered uh, spirals. Galaxies that appear in visible light to have neither bars nor companions can still have spiral waves. These galaxies may have hidden weak bars or small companions that trigger the spirals, or they may be excited entirely by small asymmetries and perturbations. So basically, uh, there could be some other things in here that I spotted the other day, but I think the, the most important one uh, for me is the fact that the, the, the resonance, the reflection off the bulge, the standing spiral wave and the fact that it leads to uh, an increase in binding energy in the central region. And this is exactly what the data was showing me for years was happening in our experiments. And here I read just over a day ago that galaxies, uh, theories about how galaxies work uh, are pointing to the same kind of phenomena. Okay. Uh, and uh, there's a lot more here and probably I will put, put some comments in the blog. I just want to show you some images of various galaxies. You go and go and look at these. These are a whole bunch of different spiral galaxies. Uh, barred spiral, barred spiral, barred spiral, great barred spiral, barred spiral. But you can see that the form of these things is extremely close. You have a bulge in the center with the bits coming out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is the spiral galaxy. Okay. It just looks like stuff going down a drain pipe, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, again, the, these barred spirals here. When, when you actually look at these ones, you, it, 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 it's like a straight line coming in. And this here, what, you, what you're seeing here is very, very, if it's going to give me the image. 
Right, there we go. Look at what you're seeing here, where you have this long line and a long line, and then this circular bit in the middle. Does that look, just, just does it look a little bit like this? Does it look a little bit like this? You've got a circular bit here in the center, and then you have a long line and a long line. This is on the Lion Reactor. When I first introduced the very, the very first video of the Lion Reactor, I said, I believe that this experiment will be one of the most important experiments, uh, or something like that. I didn't give a time scale. I just said <laughs> it just it didn't need a time scale. I genuinely believe that what I had already seen in the evidence of this experiment pointed to an unbelievable uh, array of um, sort of uh, uh, observations and and uh, uh, you know things that could be drawn from it. And uh, I, I've I've yet to be disappointed. Uh, it's it's exceeded the promise uh, that it originally gave. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to fix my camera here. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, let's go back there. So yeah, the long bar, long bar, central circular region. Okay. Uh, what else have we got? So this one I like. This is uh, mentioned. I said a tadpole over a, a question mark over a tadpole. This apparently is the, is it going to show me this one here? Or maybe there's another image of it here. This is called the tadpole. Oh dear. Galaxy. Oh dear. That's not going to be helpful, is it? Uh, except it's not the best image. Is this better? There, okay, so there we go. Uh, and what do we see coming out of the tadpole? We see a spiral. Yeah? Now, is that going in or is it coming out? Is it going in or is it coming out? Well, we know with 100% certainty that these vortical structures do lead to the production of things coming out of them. We know this because we've seen it on video. You see the glowing area. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then at, at the point it, it collapses, it ejects this structure. At the point this collapses, it ejects this structure. At the point this collapses, it ejects this, it ejects this structure. And I believe that is exactly what happened there. And I believe that this is, it's kind of two uh, structures here because, and this is why we need higher speed photography and to do more experiments, is to find out whether it's one, one thing coming out and spiraling around like that, or whether it's a pair or in some cases, more than those that form the various different structures. Okay. So that is the tadpole. Okay. And then the last one I want to show you is this one, the question mark. If it's going to show me it, is it going to show me it? This one here. What I like about this is from the center of the vortex here, it's got an ejection. And then this comes up and becomes part of this barred spiral galaxy. Yeah, this one looks like it's feeding this one. I don't believe that the material is coming down here and 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 going into this one. No, it's it's this one is ejecting something out of here, and that's coming in and feeding that one. And that takes me back to the question mark, and it takes me back to the first slide where I believe that what you are seeing here is. A uh, a yang, a yin, or a yin in the yang, and whoever's doing the making is uh, spitting something out here, and that is leading to the formation of this galaxy over here. And uh, there we go. Um, that is making galaxies. If you have any questions, um, uh, I would uh, see what they are now. <laughs> I bet your kitchen's going to look fantastic, Corky. Corky's rebuilding his kitchen, has been for some weeks. I've, I've got to do my toilet and bathroom at some point. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so I'm going to see if you've got any questions there. Yeah, all from no thing. Absolutely. So Corky, uh, bang on the money. Uh, essentially, there's a vibration that starts an eddy. The eddy is, uh, you know, builds and builds and builds. Um, but I believe that to procreate, it needs a, an anti-eddy. And the two work together to uh, uh, produce uh, progeny. Can you reshow the emitters? Uh, do you mean the slide with uh, the uh, do you mean this one? Do you mean this one, Stephen? Well, we haven't. I, I mean, I can go to the uh, original presentation that came from, which is uh, the coherent matter waves. Um, so there's a whole bunch of them in here. I, I went for the more simple ones, so it, it tied in with what Bostick had observed with the spiraling around. Uh, this was uh, going through a capillary with Slobodan Stankovic, and he produced a spiral here. This is a capillary plasmatron uh, that was done in uh, the 80s, 70s or 80s and 90s, I think, at the Russian Joint Plasma Physics Institute. And you can see the spiraling here. Uh, Klimov was forced to publish this, I believe, because Slobodan showed this at ICCF 22 in 2019. Um, and so... These are some of the first ones in, in Henk's uh, thing where we have a large plasma ball and it's in, emitting these spiraling traces. And so that was replicated quickly by Dave. And, and this for me is a absolute dead perfect ringer for um, what uh, was shown by Bostick. Okay. And we, we've seen many, many structures in there of the spiraling structures. This is another one here. And then here's a, a group. So but you can actually see, actually show it. So I will, which one have we got a video of? Um, which ones are videos? Uh, is it that one? No. If you go and uh, look at uh, some of the videos on these for the Vega experiments, maybe it's this one that got, has it got a video here? Yeah, okay. So you'll typically have an explosion. And they'll come out of the explosion. And blink and you'll miss them. <laughs> uh, what am I wanting here? There we go. I'm not showing you a thing. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, you can't see. Okay. All right. There we go. All right. So yeah, you'll have an explosion and it'll emit these things. Unfortunately, the timeline on here skips about 20 frames. Oh, that, that you can see, okay, so there, 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 there. So you can see prior to the explosion, you have uh, some cohering going on. And then it is missing a load of frames, but then you get you get an, what looks like an explosion, and you get the start of the emission, and uh, it's skipped a frame because the, this is sixty frames a second, but it's only exposing it for fifty percent of the uh, frame of the frame. So you you're missing a frame here, or it might just be because this doesn't show every other every frame. So you can see it's jumped jumped one sixtieth of a second. It's yeah, it's done it there again. Anyway, you can see this is a kind of an M&M track. And I showed how these things can probably be formed by rotating on a couple of axes where you have two structures rotating around each other. So this is a typical one. You get the boom and then it, it, it fires it out. There's probably plenty more in this one. Okay, so there's one down there. So there's a big explosion here. And then this one comes out and it's very, very flat actually spiraling around here 
spirals off to their side there. Uh, let's see if a different one. Um, I hope this was what you were after. Okay, there we go. So we've got to have a boom, and then we get the spiral coming out here. Yeah, so this one down here. It's it's so quick. I don't know where that one's come from. It's it, it appeared. <laughs> this one blows up and it's you can see it coming out here and it actually goes over here. Goes over the uh anode. Over the anode and over the top. <laughs> It's rather cute. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's a whole bunch of them here. Different ones. That's the one I showed you earlier. I th maybe I've got this one as a video. Is that a video? Yeah, it's a video. So let me see if I can stop it. Okay, so here you can see that's the frame before and there's something building here. And it goes boom, and you can see the start of the uh, ejection here. And it comes out, you can see the spiral form here. Spiral form. Spiral form. And you can see it's 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 coming together. It's a uh, and this is essentially what Bostic store, but it's just and it when 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 this in my view coherent matter hits the cathode, look what look what happens in one sixtieth of a second. Boom! <laughs> it just dis disrupts, does a columbic explosion, and then because there's so many intensely energetic ions around here, the focus of the discharge moves to that point. In fact, you can see something dying that, that actually is left over. That's it. Okay. Okay, so in the Bostic paper book, page 409, you showed what emitted plasmoids, oh, from four directions towards the center, yes. So let, I'll, I'll show you, um, yeah, so you are asking for, in the original Bostic 1956 paper, it's quite simple. Uh, it's, a, it's a high current step pulse. Of course, that that might be the harder part, but these things are well described for other things these days. So he's got a, a copper tabs for connecting your power, current in, current out. <laughs> um, this is a resin support for the back end of it. Then he has a ceramic disc. And then these are deuterated titanium wire electrodes. 0.04 of an inch and there's a gap of 0 0.05 of an inch gap between them and there's two holes through it and in fact you can actually buy ceramic discs for pass-throughs I think I looked at this when we were doing some work which already have two holes cut into them and in fact you can get them with multiple holes so you could you could find a st standard part uh, and then just put your uh, uh, your deuterated uh, titanium wire through that and then you can seal the copper electrodes and stuff in the epoxy resin and uh, that's your little unit that you uh is your gun and then you do your current pulse and it produces the plasmoid now the thing is this does produce an unplasmoid uh, unstable plasmoid but why where, where shoulders improved this is he went from uh that to having a an electrode over here and one here and actually using an ecton type explosion by emitting it from a tip so you then get the the toroidal uh, and uh, sorry poloidal and toroidal forces coming out of the tip um, and uh, because tungsten wore out he then wetted that with mercury so it forms a tailor cone and then it comes out of the end of the tailor cone and obviously uh, uh, the mercury is very heavy and so it is good at stabilizing the the 
exotic vacuum objects. So his method of producing them, but um, the self-organizing plasma just it just does it anyway. It just does it really really quickly uh, in H H O for whatever reason. It's doing it very very quickly, and and so th this is a real way of um, exploring it. And, and we know that uh, the ultra experiments are producing the exact same effects. And as I say, the removing of angular momentum via these the spiral arms leads to uh, higher binding energy in the center. And I believe that forms more coherence. And the coherence is, uh, is what causes the nuclear transmutation to occur. Because uh, when you have in, uh, higher binding energy than all other uh, solid matter, you get unusual reactions occurring, uh, according to Ken Childers. Okay. Okay, Bob, can you comment on why a newborn galaxy would have a very high redshift? No, I can't. <laughs> um, can I comment on that? Let, let me give me a millisecond. Uh, like I say, I've I've not been really into astronomy. I I, I was trying to solve an energy problem. Uh, I had no idea that this would lead down this pathway. Um, okay, so um, well, uh, when when plasmoids start dying they go from blue to red <laughs> they do uh, uh, so initially they're highly energetic so you when you when you see those flashes in in vega evo blaster initially it's a a very intense blue shift but uh, blue light rather but uh, it goes to red the plasmoids tend to go to red and then actually they blow up uh, you know it's like ball lightning tends to go to red uh, before it uh, its demise, so maybe there's something to do with that. Um, uh, it, it, if you actually look at uh, what's going on here in this, in this, it's not quite the same energy, but you can see it's white here, and white is either a lot of whatever photon at all, and the sensor is seeing it as white, but it could be actually a f higher energy photon as well. And as it goes and and loses energy, it becomes redder. It, that's just what you see. <laughs> that's just what you see. It's cooling, right? The photons, you know, very high energy photons, are, you know, UV and and uh, then, you know, uh, X-ray and then gamma rays, you know, low energy photons are visible and down to infrared and, and then you get sort of radio waves, don't you? So, there we go. Emitters and the water are better anti-gravity resolutions. Uh, I think I know what you mean. Could those four emitters be done in water? Um, well, uh, possibly. Um, you could have four sonotrodes. Uh, uh, with with the work of Cardone, he used a, a son sonicator and then it went down into a cone. I'm going to talk more about that. Um, I've already shown you that if you had a flat uh, a sonicator, uh, it, it ends up forming a cone, and that that we've observed in a number of experiments. In fact, wherever there's a, you just get the the cones forming. So they forced it by having in the aluminium cone, and they put that into the mercury, and so that is focusing the energy. If you think about it, what you have on a scanning electron microscope is that you have a, a heated tungsten and then a tungsten tip, and the tip goes into a pre-built Taylor cone, and that forces all of the energy down to the end, and you get thermionic emission of the electrons. So you could do something, and you just had uh, three conical. Uh, um, uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about something. I, 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 I've wanted to do it for so long, but I'm not even going to trailer what what it is. But um, something related to this, and it's just going to—I think it's going to blow people's minds. Uh, I've got a, about four years of collected stuff on it. It's all related to this, but it's more, um, yeah, it's it, it's it's the same thing. It, it, it's all field interactions. But anyway, um, but it is to do with uh, multiple production of of um, these kind of vortical structures. 
I mean, in the case of uh, Suhas Ralkar, he was uh, he had a sonicator this way, a sonicator this way, and a sonicator this way, uh, ultrasonic horns. So he was kind of doing it, but he did it from three directions, and then he had one flat surface above. So effectively, he had uh, reflection off the the, the back side. I wonder if the binding energy of the coherent matter changes the rate of transmission of photons. Um, I think so. If if you end up forming these exotic vacuum structures, which store themselves into metals, I believe that they change the uh, energy state of the electrons in the orbitals, and because they are changed, then when they get promoted to a higher level and drop down, they end up producing a different uh, uh, photon. And so when you excite it in a, a scanning electron microscope, you hit it with the E-beam, it knocks out an electron, and then another electron comes in and it, it, it drops down or whatever. You, you, you get the wrong X-rays back. Uh, and so we saw this when we took um, John Hutchison's uh, coral twist sample and we put it on an XRF which is an x-ray fluorescent uh, uh, yeah, a device for determining elements and it, it couldn't determine some of the elements much like we couldn't properly determine some of the elements in the Lion reactors and it's because of this effect I believe the same effect that was observed by Xu and Zhu during three body alignments and that's because the, the 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 whole environment is isn't acting in the way that it normally would to allow the propagation of light to travel in the same way it normally does, and so um, uh, you get this odd spectrum back, and so so we would see spectrum from like yttrium, and it wasn't yttrium uh, because there wasn't the other bands, but uh, or there was another element like uh, I don't know technetium or something so, something that obviously cannot be there. Uh, um, and so it's like fake transmuted elements. It's not real transmuted elements. It's fake transmuted elements. Um, so, you know, uh, but the elements is is not the same as it normally is in ordinary matter because it has uh, these changed spectral lines. Okay. Right. Well, it is one fifteen for me here. Um, I'm just going to do a quick review of what we've been through today. Um, so this was uh, making galaxies, and uh, this was an image that I captured uh, and saved to my directory from my research into the, the original sort of draft. Uh, presentations that I wanted to work through for O Day, and I, but I never had enough data on the 28th of January 2018 to add it as an actual slide. It just sat there in the directory, going, "One day, this will explain what what's going on here." And uh, uh, the reason that I thought it would be able to explain that is because of things that I had seen on the Lion experiment, um, and one of those things was this, and th this. And these reflected elements and these magnetic field lines and uh, but predominantly these things which I shared for the first time in Sochi and uh, this is a three arm spiral galaxy this is a two arm spiral galaxy and this really for me did look like some of those bar spirals so you you have a, a structure that looked like a, a bar spiral galaxy and I'd also seen uh, structures that uh, when you zoomed into them, they they had the the sense that they 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 had five rings around them, and this led me to come up with this structure for the thing that does it. And if you can imagine that you had this structure and you had two of them kind of back to back like that, uh, two tori like that, and one's throwing something out that way, and one's throwing something out that way, you would have a bar in between, and you would have a beam coming out that way and a beam coming out that way. So. That's kind of how I see these things occurring. And it's supported by what was observed in the Lion 
uh, this, these flat but one laid on top of the other, flat but one laid on top of the other, one laid on top of the other. Uh, these are, and I said at the time that this was in the center line of the solenoid, but along the length of the reactor. And this was in the center line here of the solenoid. Uh, and uh, you know so it had to be related to the field going through the center of the solenoid in both cases and here we have the solenoid pattern uh, that I came across in 2020 um, uh, and it showed exactly the same thing and he said that this is a signature of a coherent nuclear process and then I just overlaid these two onto here with your counter rotating vortices and so forth and uh, that's that and then you can see the various ear shaped structures here uh, I believe is similar to what's observed on the silicon uh, dioxide and on the x-rays and uh, I said that this by this other th third party where you have counter rotating voices, vortices here but they maybe have some sort of attraction between these two and these look like they're going around the same way but out of the center of this you have this helical beam coming out of the center of this you have this helical beam coming and I had seen this in our own work on the Amaz vibrator plates out of the center you have a helical beam and I believe that the coherent matter is formed in the center here and why do I believe that well I believe that's because you've got the transmutation occurring in here and it's in a helical form and so uh, it's not hard to understand that that's what's going on and here uh, you can do it in a, a sound experiment and the material comes in in a helical form and it comes into a structure that has two sections to it which is something which I latter saw, latterly saw uh, in Henk's Vega experiment where we saw the well-known uh, hemispherical balls of fire these uh, structures with their double layers but also these very distinct two spots within them which had to be explained and I believe it is explained so we got our spiral galaxy here and our spiral galaxy here pair counter rotating just like the one in the cover slide same thing here and uh, very nice work by Bin Zhuen Huang uh, the uh, professor of new energy uh, at the Department of Mechanical Engineering National Taiwan University Taipei Taiwan and uh, he shows this you can see this is above and I guess this may be below um, but uh, that gives you some idea of the le the direction of the vorticity um, but uh, definitely the bulge in the center this is the bar and then these are the arms so very very similar effects uh, and then we talked about in the the uh, Bostic work how he said there was two bands and uh, you know one spirals around the other so this one's going around here but is this coming under here and coming around here and going around there I don't know but we did see something similar in our ultra experiment uh, and so I, I thought this bead chain was quite representative so maybe there's some spiraling going on here but um, this is on top of this this is on top of this one of these is on top of the other that's on top of this this is another ultrasound this is indium that's gone through um, and then you overlay the two and there was this thing coming out the side thing coming out the side I thought what is that and it was a long time before I saw something that uh, looked exactly because we know that this is a magneto hydrodynamic structure we know it was formed by a plasmoid uh, by a plasma process this therefore must have been a self-organized plasma structure it transmuted the tungsten to all of the elements that are uh, transmuted to when you start with heavy elements and out of this pole it shoved a beam which looked like a typical strange radiation track and I thought pin it, put a pin in that see if we see anything in the future and we did and then uh, I learn and I've colorized this it was just black and white in his paper um, but if you have two interacting plasmoids with certain parameters they will orbit around each other uh, in the environment if the environment is right in its different environments um, the structure which is like a double layered torus uh, if you look from the top uh, you see this and I took this structure and moved it in the 3d software lightweight 3d uh, with some uh, motion blur with a, a, a few thousand into frame frames and uh, it produces a track like this and this is the track uh, from a straight uh, plasmoid moving moving in the Boutillier experiment in Canada 
And so there's the stuff. And I talked about how nucleons from palladium and silver can uh, become lighter elements, all of these usual suspect lighter elements, and they uh, produce this cardioid structure and this kind of broken cardioid, which actually tells you something about what's going on. And we have the same thing on um, Omar. We have the same thing in Par Parkamov's reactor 225 and so forth. And the fact that, again, we see in Matsumoto's, the higher nucleons come out of the pole and it produces a plume of erupted material. And we saw something almost identical on indium exposed to a miles of gas. I won't go into that. And then I spoke about this by uh, David Boutlier and it was analyzed by Alan Goldwater in his Magic Sound Lab. And this is on the end of a tungsten rod with his uh, ultrasonicated uh, uh, HHO generator. And this produced something which I believe is a almost a dead ringer, uh, you know, given the variabilities of whatever. This is in a sound system focused. This is in a plasma uh, from a HHO jet onto tungsten. But you have one side that's raised above and the other one that's much lower down. Uh, but the elements are all the same elements. And in this one, we have the explosion point where the plasma plasmoid came in. I believe that's what's occurring. And it comes in, it comes in. And when you analyze these elements, you've got the same elements. On the tungsten in Amasa, we have the same structure. So you have these plasmoids going around and you get the same elements. And uh, uh, the same elements here. You do see some some other heavier elements here, like you've got some negligible tin, not really worth writing home about. Uh, probably not strontium, and uh, uh, but maybe. Um, and then you have uh, uh, these elements uh, from iron, but uh, otherwise it's all the same. And there's a bunch of spiral galaxies. So uh, for some reason I put that symbol up there, which is quite fun. <laughs> um, so uh, there we go. Uh, that is my review. And then uh, we looked at um, this documents here uh, by a couple of papers by Bostick, the 1956 paper. An experimental study of ionized matter projected across a magnetic field and the 1957 paper, an experimental study of plasmoids. And then we went and looked at various galaxies and so forth. And we also looked at this article. And the key things out of this article is that uh, the material is moved to the center and uh, um, uh, the spiral arms remove, uh, they, re they remove, uh, uh, what is it, uh, angular momentum from the center of the galaxy and uh, allow it to achieve a higher binding energy. I believe that's exactly kind of some analog is going on in our other systems and that's what it's saying and uh, also the fact that it's a standing standing spiral wave so uh, with uniform rotation rate so th this is a basically a type of like standing sound um, which reflects off the bulge in the center okay so that is that. That is making galaxies. Um, I'll check if there's any, any other comments and then I'll say good night. Yeah, when, it, when, when they're different, you know, how long does that different last? Does the difference change when you expose it to other coherent radiation, maybe knocking that difference out, maybe? I don't know. Um, we shall see. Hi, Blues Doctor. Long time no see. Um, yeah, it's been a fun, this one. Uh, uh, the great thing is to... Uh, I've been able to replicate uh, the work on a Mars gas. And uh, to just finish off, um, we we spoke to, uh, I think, Perkin Elmer or whatever the company is that supply the, uh, uh, the system for scintillation of liquids. And they will supply us the device and the liquid as long as we have a location that can 
except the radioactive tritium uh, and that that we are working over and uh, contacting various people in the UK it's best that we do this in the UK and um, there, there are obviously challenges there so the universities are given the runaround you can do it in a private institution but there's there's risks with that um, there was someone mentioning that uh, you know you might have the right place you might be able to buy the equipment but then you might not have the qualifications to run the experiment anyway we've already working in the background to get around that if that trick is pulled on us um but uh you know i'm i'm, I'm extremely confident uh of course i might be wrong or we might get something wrong or it might not work first term and you know they don't want to know after that but i'm i'm given the fact that we can see this transmutation occurring all of the time, what your Brown, Brown observed, what has been observed by so many other parties, um, uh, I, I think that uh, I think we're going to uh, see the right result. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's going to be such a simple thing to test. So the idea is that we, we build a device that has all the schematics shared and uh, it's uh, built with widely available uh, consumable laboratory items uh, using this standardized uh, scintillation system and uh, using this the actual calibration source for the scintillation system and using that uh, it could be easily replicated so um, uh, and, and then it's done it's done and so that would give us the quantitative and qualitative data we need that they are that, that is the current barrier <laughs> the current barrier um, for us to get in the door at TEPCO um, so I, I've got more of the calcium carbonate uh, on its way to uh, Dave in in Canada from Vietnam thank you to my lovely wife for organizing that and um, uh, so he can run some tests and we can do some like preliminary design checks and and so but once it once it's once it's established then um I mean, it's it's going to be such a hundred percent proof of of Lena. Uh, so you know, it may fail, but we 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 the only way to guarantee failure is to not try. And so um, we're going to try, going to keep trying, keep trying until we can do it. Um, and uh, if it does work, then Lena is a done deal. It definitely, 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 definitely works. <laughs> Uh, okay, blues. Yeah, yeah, Dan. Um, I, I, it's it's difficult to know. And when 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 I came, when I had the realization at the beginning of two thousand and seventeen, that was one thing. When I would come to re write the draft, sort of, <laughs> what, what should we call it? Mammoth lesson plan for for O Day, um, in uh, January two thousand and eighteen. The, the enormity of the implications I mean it, it, it is it is the God's toolbox um, and uh, we are at the dawn of an old age because it is clear that people knew how to use uh, oxyhydrogen gas in the past they knew how to use sound to do coherence and to use those as manufacturing and and uh, uh, fashioning technologies and it's so far beyond some of the stuff that we are currently using but it is the way sadly that weapons technology is going it uh, coherent matter technology um but uh it is in my view the 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 way that the the universe is building uh it's building itself it's organizing itself and it's procreating other galaxies this for me is the uh the ultimate young family here you know you got uh daddy mummy and uh child number one over here and it's it's just to to see and understand that that's what's going on and and, and then to be able to to replicate it in the laboratory here in japan and to replicate it here in japan and to replicate it here in 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 uh you know in uh holland and in here in this room i'm sitting in and and to have this observed in in uh, 
uh, obviously the experiment was done in Japan and you've seen it the second took it took seconds to do the experiment but to see this beam coming out and and it to be in my view unequivocally the same thing as this and then later to see this it's like when I saw these things, it was like, oh, my God, seriously? Seriously? Is it always going to do this? <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's a thing of beauty. And, and the, the way that the, the, this structure can just tear matter apart, it literally rips matter apart. And, of course, it, these are the elements you see. But, of course, it will be producing a lot of oxygen. It will be producing a lot of argon, neon, and, and xenon, and all kinds of... Not xenon in this case, but... Uh, um, xenon in the case of the tungsten um these gases will be lost so there's a lot of nucleons that, that disappear from from the experiment um and helium of course lots of helium um so yeah the people were thinking that it was causing helium by fusing two deutrons but it's more likely to be producing helium by just fissioning the, the palladium and the, and the silver yeah, I mean, for me, the the, the huge win about um, replicating Bostic, I mean, it, it's not that just replicating Bostic. We're replicate, replicating Bostic in a hydrodynamic system. He clearly says in the 1956 paper or 57 paper, it is a magneto-hydrodynamic system. But what he sees, we see in the hydrodynamic system. We see in the hydrodynamic system, in the magneto-hydrodynamic system, in the hydrodynamic system, in the magneto-hydrodynamic system. Um, and this particular image here for me, this 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 one from um, uh, coherent matter wave beams here, this one for me, this this here, this structure here, absolutely one hundred percent. And his he, they were hypotheses. They were hypothesis. How do you say that? Is a plural of hypothesis. <laughs> this structure here. This, this here, this, this here is 100% this. It is that. It is that. It is that. He was right. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to, uh, what I'll do is I will look through your comments. If there's anything that needs to be answered question, I will try and answer the questions in remoteview.icu on the blog for this Making Galaxies uh, presentation. Um, and, and when I'm saying is, we, we're not making galaxies, we're, we're making analogues of galaxies in uh, our various works here. But they're kind of like a mini, mini galaxy when you're looking at the, uh, uh, what should we say? Uh, when we when we when we're looking at this, it's it's kind of like a mini galaxy. It's kind of like a mini mini galaxy. These are these are like mini galaxies, but uh, uh, they, these where are they? they? These are the same structures. They're just on a different scale. As above, so below. It's all the same thing. So thank you very very much. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to share this with you today. And uh, uh, we are at the dawn of an old age. And uh, I, I, I kind of have to respect uh, the people that came long, long before us that went to the trouble of observing what was going on around them and uh, realizing how this works. It's almost certainly, in my view, the technology that brought our species or the genetic code that uh, is a, a large part of our species uh, to this planet. And uh, I believe it's the technology and the understanding of this technology that will allow us to um, have a trip back to wherever it was we came from and, uh, you know, participate in other areas of this beautiful, beautiful universe that we live in. Uh, and it, it, it is the same thing. It's the same thing everywhere. Yin and yang, maker, breaker and uh, creator. And... Uh, you know, thank the Lord. Uh, uh, he he re really, it's just the most beautiful simplicity of design. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, you have to be in awe of, of how simplest, how just such simple rules can lead to the formation of literally anything. <laughs> it's just literally anything. So thank you. I'll say good night. Sayonara. Uh, Dos vidanya. Hasta luego. Uh, 
Wenn es noch ist, dobre Nacht.